Radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening. Fade to Black. Bespoke radio for the masses. Yeah. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? It's Fade to Black. Thursday night, it is Fader Night. July 12, 2018. That's right. 193 days into the new year. Just 172 days left. We are live from a bunker somewhere. In beautiful downtown Burbank, California. And I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. I am your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? How you doing? Thursday night, it's Fader night, I'm in the chair, very special presentation tonight, because tonight we have very special guest, Barrett Brown is with us, that's right, one of the most important voices of our generation, and tonight we're going to break it all down, journalism, prison, the mass media, And what it is like to live a life going against the grain so he can speak the truth. That is our evening tonight. And then, later on, it's Fader Night, which means open lines. So Barrett is going to hang with me and take your phone calls. And this is your opportunity to not only reach out to Barrett and ask those questions you've always wanted to ask... And, and it, it's all there for you, but also to say thank you, all right? And so you can do that all night tonight. And wouldn't it be fun? You know what? <laughs> I want to hear one of you ask Barrett a UFO question. And uh, uh, the other day, um, I, I you know, I don't want to reveal, a, you know, too much private conversation. But the other day, uh, Barrett and I were talking uh, last week. And he brought up Heinlein. And I was like, right on, right? So anyway, and we were talking about uh, late night talk radio, you know, coast to coast and and other things. And he had brought up some of his uh, articles that he had written, you know, futurism. And he's right there, you know. And it was so fun to hear that side of him. So maybe we'll go there tonight, too, as well. It's your opportunity to do that. It is your show. Our guest tonight is Barrett Brown. And uh, also, I did want to mention that uh, John Rappaport, again, is out doing research. And he had sent me uh, this text, which allowed us to, you know, get Barrett in here tonight, too, as well. Now, I've been working on the show uh, with Barrett now for two years. I'll talk uh, more about that in just a bit. But... um, so I get this this text uh, from uh, Rappaport because, man, okay, I'm I'm going back out emergency research 
And uh, and I said, you know, go do your thing, man. I just come back and report from the road, right? So that allowed us to do this show tonight. It's called Synchronicity. Everything just worked out. So tonight, Bear Brown is here. And I wrote up a little piece over at On Stellar today. Um, and I, I do want to say, uh, spending my days over at On Stellar, I mention it here all the time, but you must understand, I'm a social media person. I like to uh, get out there and connect with all of you. Uh, this is a big, big, big community, and we have uh, managed to uh, join together, and we do it over at On Stellar. So I was over there today. I was writing and reading and I posted uh, a little uh, thing about tonight's show over there uh, about Barrett. So you can go and check that out. Um, and it, it spells out some details. And some of that, you know, I like to post my show notes over at, because I write, you know, during the day and I'm getting, you know, my head together. So uh, I like to post those show notes over at OnStellar so you kind of get... Uh, an idea of what I'm going to talk about on on the show each evening. And you can go check out all of that over at OnStellar. And I love everybody's responses to profile pics because I get get it all day long. Dude, I got okay, man. You know, I'm all good, man. Profile pic. And I immediately uh, friend and connect. Uh, Yeah. So get over to OnStellar, O-N-S-T-E-L-L-A-R.com. An amazing social media platform that is built for this community. We've got some big changes coming up. Yes, uh, our video channels uh, will be happening uh, very shortly. So stay tuned with that. There's going to be a live streaming element uh, ready to go. And I think we're going to do our first run on that. I'm going to host it uh, in about a week. So get ready. Uh, We'll announce who who my guest will be. And it's, it, you know, it's a testing of the platform just to make sure everything is cool. Uh, so that's coming up. So on Stellar, O-N-S-T-E-L-L-A-R.com. Use my uh, referral code, which is Jimmy. You're going to want to do that, so just do it. Jimmy, get over to on Stellar, get registered, and come and hang out with all of us. You can follow me on Twitter, at J Church Radio. Facebook is still alive for us for the time being. Cannot wait. Ah, until I never click on Facebook again. I'm closing that thing down. And YouTube is still alive for us, too, as well. You know, we've got, I don't know, you know, 60,000 some odd subscribers over there. Um, You know, we have our Fade or Nots, and we have our podcast, and we have those subscriptions and and other things that are out there. But there are so many out there that just go to YouTube for their content. And I get that. So do we keep YouTube alive? I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't. I really don't. All right. But in the meantime, it's all there. You can go to JimmyChurchRadio.com and go and, and, you know, follow, like, subscribe, do whatever you want to do. And if you're going to hang out with us in Twitter, at uh, JChurchRadio, of course, is the my Twitter feed. But hashtag F2B is the sandbox. So we'll go through a few thousand tweets tonight like we do every single night on Fade to Black. Come and hang out with us. Join the conversation there. And we have two chat rooms open, one at Spreaker and one at KGRA, the planet. You can also email throughout the show, Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Okay, uh, breaking news. Let's get straight to it. We've got a lot of stuff to discuss tonight. Breaking news. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention said today that 27 more people have gotten sick in a multi-stake outbreak of salmonella. That's right. And all of this is linked to Kellogg's Honey Smacks. Used to be called Sugar Smacks. Honey Smacks. That's right. The cereal. This brings the total number of illnesses to 100 since March. And the outbreak was not announced until June. Yeah. It's crazy. That just makes you just want to just stop and think. All right there. 20% discount right now on all offerings from River Moon Coffee. And the promo code there is Coffee Break. Two words. Coffee Break. Two words. RiverMoonCoffee.com. And that includes our Fade to Black Blend. Okay. 20% off. Right now, River Moon Coffee. 
Don't forget to sign up for our Soul Tech Gathering up at East SETI Ranch. It is this August 9th through the 12th. All you have to do is go to soultechgathering.com. It's going to be an amazing event. We've got James Gilliland. We've got Jason Quick, Matthew Ryan, Michaela Sheldon, Teresa Yanaris, Holly Marie, Mary Gabrielle, John Lund, Dana Harvey, Billy Carson, Laura Cantu, and Christine Contini all there to teach. We've got five classrooms set up. We're going to be teaching for four days. You're going to want to come and hang out and learn. All right? And and I'm going to be there. We have sky watching going on every single night uh, out on the Field of Dreams. We've got music. We've got entertainment. We've got a party for Saturday night. There are day passes now available. If you don't want to come and, and camp and hang out, you just want to come for, for one day, Come and do it. Okay, Friday, if you want to come out for one day, we've got the opening ceremonies and, and everything going on in, in the big hall. And then, of course, Saturday are classrooms all day long. And I'm going to be doing a couple of panels uh, in the uh, in the big conference room. So that's going on. And then, of course, Sunday, the party. All right, great food. Everything is uh, set up and amazing. Come and hang out with us. All right, it is Soul Tech Gathering dot com all right don't forget to subscribe to our podcast we have over 885 archive shows custom apps apple android all platforms just two dollars a month you can also become a fade or not in our membership section on the site where you get the bunker cam everybody's watching me right now it's kind of weird right it's radio but i've got a camera in here uh, last month when we went through our, our issues with YouTube and we weren't running the bunker cam, it was great. I had two weeks of no camera staring at me in the face. But unfortunately, I've got it now. There you go. Hello, everybody. You like my shirt? Hawaiian shirt? That's right. Sent to me. It's a Bali shirt, actually. Not quite Hawaiian. Sent to me from Reverend Jimmy Pearson over in the UK. Love it. Absolutely love it. He sent me a collection. That's right. And you get to see it right now in the bunker cam. If you can't see it, that's why. All right. Don't forget all of our sponsors. Okay. Life Change Tea, Get the Tea.com, River Moon Coffee, Ancient Life Oil, Sacred Skulls, New Mana Food Storage, and of course, Bearing Optics Night Vision Goggles. Let's get this show cracking. Happy birthday to today. Topher Grace is 40. He was great in American Ultra. He was really good in Get Shorty, the series. And you remember uh, Dan Fogler, right? Right, Dan Fogler? He was on the show here a couple of years ago. Uh, star of the film Don Peyote. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, you got to check out Don Peyote. But also, and Freeman. Freeman flies in Don Peyote. But Topher Grace is also in Don Peyote. Cheryl Ladd today is 67, and most would think, well, you know, I'm saying that because of Charlie's Angels. I am not. No. It's the movie Millennium, one of the great time travel movies of all time. If you've never seen Millennium, go check it out. Michelle Rodriguez today is 40. I'm a big fan of Michelle, but I became a bigger fan after I watched this ayahuasca documentary now obviously i've i've never taken ayahuasca or dmt i don't i just don't do those things i drink coffee chilled vodka and uh thick prime rib steaks that's my life right and friends and family that's me but ayahuasca is intriguing you know and i try to study it and a lot of our guests here talk about it and graham hancock so i'm watching this ayahuasca documentary starring michelle rodriguez and she goes down to South America, and she does the ceremony. And you get to talk to see her before and after. It's amazing. Michelle Rodriguez, happy birthday. Today she is 40. Our dead guy's birthday today is Charlie Murphy, 1959 to 2017. Died at the age of 57. Best known as being a contributing writer and member of the sketch comedy show Chappelle Show alongside comedian David Chappelle. But it was his first major role in the 1993 film CB4 that remains his funniest. That's right, playing Gusto in the city of low cash. 
Murphy ended up uh, dying from leukemia last year on April 12th at the age of 57. On this day in history, OTD Disco starts its decline on this day in 1979 with the infamous Disco Demolition Night at Chicago's Kaminsky Park. That incident, which led to at least nine injuries, 39 arrests, and the cancellation and forfeit of a Major League Baseball game, is widely credited or blamed, whichever one you want to choose, with dealing Disco its death blow on this day in 1979. Now, here you go. Fader fact. Is you ready? Fader fact. As of 1998... Over 50% of Iceland's population believed in the existence of, wait for it, elves. <laughs> That's your fader fact. All right. Tonight, very special guest Barrett Brown is here. And we've been setting up this show for two years. And I have covered anonymous I have covered hacktivism. I have uh, interviewed many times Greg Hausch on this program and Coast to Coast and Gabriella Coleman, otherwise known as Bella. I have attended the Hope Conference. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Hope Conference in New York City, Manhattan at the Roosevelt Hotel right there, 7th Avenue. And uh, I have gone... As deep as I can uh, into all of this, I have. And there are three documentaries that all of them have appeared in, uh, Barrett and Greg and Gabriella and those of Anonymous. Uh, the documentaries are We Are Legion, Terms and Conditions, Terms and Conditions May Apply, and The Hacker Wars. And those are three films that after tonight's show, uh, I suggest this after every time I interview uh, somebody from Anonymous, uh, these are three films that you need to go and watch. And it's not so much about Anonymous, because there's the intriguing part of that, right? The Guy Faust mask. So there's there's the, all of that and, and who they are and that mystery. And I, I get that. But... You need to go uh, uh, back further and, and a little bit wider on why even Anonymous is here. Okay? But then you have the other parts of it where lives were affected. Now, um, I stayed at the same hotel in New York with uh, Gabriella and Greg Hausch uh, when I was there for the uh, Hope Conference, Hackers on Planet Earth. And... Greg Hausch and Gabriella. Well, Gabriella is a professor in college and, and that. But Greg Hausch, somebody that also was sent to prison, uh, one of the nicest, coolest, brightest, intelligent people you could ever be around. Very cool guy. And to think about the wrath that was brought down on his life and the complications from all of that, the price that was paid – it's it's enormous, and it's incredible. And you meet him, and you just think, it's just not right. It's not fair. I have thoroughly gone into all of this since everything started to surface back in the early 2000s. On March 6, 2012, the FBI executed search warrants at Barrett Brown's apartment and and also over at his mother's house, and they were looking for evidence of these crimes. The items that they seized, including, uh, and, and listen to this, they were looking for records related to H.B. Gary, InfraGuard, Endgame Systems, Anonymous, LulzSec, the famous LulzSec, IRC Chats, Twitter, uh, Wiki, uh, Echelon2.org, and Payspin, right? Agents uh, left with computers. By the way, uh, all of this was on a live feed uh, and that, that's a, another story, too. We'll talk to Barrett about that. And then you have, as this reaches out, now, I was uh, thoroughly researching all of this um, in the 2000s and just totally all the way up through the end of, of everything. 
And then you have uh, Jeremy Hammond. Talked about him a lot on this show. He was sentenced back in 2013, a kid, a kid, to serve 10 years in prison for hacking Stratfor, along, of course, with Greg Housh and uh, Barrett Brown, and, uh, and releasing those leaks through WikiLeaks. Now, you may not know, I, I talk about a lot on this show, but when, when I talk about WikiLeaks and I talk about uh, these individuals, you need to understand the, the connection and the relationships with all of this and how the man just couldn't handle it. Ten-year prison sentence for releasing stuff on WikiLeaks. Ten years. Jeremy Hammond. Look up that name and look at his face. And you, you just tell me, is that right? Brown faced up to 45 years in federal prison. They originally brought down, and that's just for Stratfor, by the way, but uh, they hit him with 105 years, just like they did with Greg House and Jeremy Hammond. He faced up to 45 years in federal prison for allegedly sharing a link, a link, a hyperlink, a link to the data Stratfor as part of his Project PM. The shared link was apparently from Hammond's hack. Now, I, I need you to understand. You copy and paste a link, and now you're looking at 45 years. As part of the charges, 105 years overall for sharing a link. The arrest were all due to an informant known as Sabu. I have uh, talked to everybody about Sabu. Sabu was put in a bad position uh, by the FBI. And he had his family, he had his kids, and they were doing the same thing to him. And then everybody fell. Barrett Brown, Jeremy Hammond, of course, Greg Housh. It was an incredible situation. All because the man and security agencies and private security companies couldn't handle what was going on with their own computers. We are talking about young adults here. And we're talking about the computer age. And we're talking about 1984. It's exactly what was going on here. And in Barrett Brown's case, he's a journalist. He is uh, a hacktivist. He is somebody that's out there trying to make change in society. He copied and pasted a link, and then everything unraveled for him. And they came straight after his mom. Some of the things that were posted uh, by Barrett, uh, videos, we will talk about that, the, the bathtub videos, and and others uh, threatening the FBI uh, because of a direct result of, you know, not only his emotional state at the time and, and certainly being threatened and being on the run, but uh, for them coming down on his mom and it. And which is what the man does. And the man did all of this and going back to Sabu because they couldn't control the narrative. They couldn't. They did. Anonymous was decentralized. There was a very loose situation that was going on here that they didn't understand. And that's where we are today. And when we go back and look. We look at the events of 2016, 2017, and we think about the complications in our lives today with mass media, with social media platforms, with, with fake news and, and the journalism that is going on today and the way that the man controls us and not only controls the daily dogma that they continue to do, but they want to divide and conquer all of us and get us in fighting. That's how you control us, by getting us out of control, getting our eyes off of the prize, getting our eyes away from the reality of, of the important things that are out there. And you need to think about that. And who is doing something about that, the decentralization of everything? Well, certainly on Stellar and what it represents is part of that. But this is something that uh, Barrett Brown and others 
have been talking about and and seeing the future of for a very long time for us and paid the price because the man doesn't want us talking about it. That's the importance of the show. It's the importance of my life. And when you sit down and listen to me um, on an evening uh, talking about friends and family and cooking out and and this community and and everything that I deal with on this show and cracking jokes and music and, and guitar and and all of that, these are the things that drive me. And I know that you are concerned by the same things because that's why you are here. So going back two years ago, as I started to cover all of these important things and I went out to New York and I went to the Hope Conference and I, I was out there with my team and my production team and, and cameras and producers and directors and assistants and sound and lights and all of that stuff that we did going into the Hope Conference. And it wasn't a pretty day for me weekend because uh, not only was Barrett in prison and others in prison and Jeremy Hammond, uh, these things were going on for them. And I show up as a member for, of the media and a television network and a radio network trying to get this story out. Why? Because nobody else will talk about it. And that's why I was there. And that it, it continues to this day. And and now Barrett got out of prison and I've been after Barrett for the last two years because tonight is the trifecta. Gabriella, Bella, Greg Hausch, and now tonight, Barrett Brown. It's a very important show. You need to understand how Barrett got here, how I got here, what joined us up tonight, and and you are going to be part of all of this. Okay? And now, so, this is the setup for the show. We're going to do two segments with Barrett and myself, and then after that, we're going to open up the phone lines for you. It's an important day. You will remember this show. Have fun. Enjoy it. Listen. Listen to it again. And there you go. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. I am so happy to have gotten to July 12th, 2018. Barrett Brown will be here right after this short break. You can follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. You can follow Barrett at Barrett Brown underscore at the end. It's all right there in Twitter. Now, I'm going to go to a break. And when I come back, or while I'm at break, I want you to check out this tweet that I'm about to do of Barrett. It's absolutely incredible. I'll be right back. Stay with me. Listening to Jimmy Church fade to black. Fade to black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net, KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in, and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black. You create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. What can I say about the most popular tea on the internet? And what do customers say about life change tea at getthetea.com? A lot. But by federal law, we at GetTheTea.com cannot make claims to how this product can enhance your health 
We cannot even post our testimonies without being in compliance. So how do we get past the hump? Try our products at GetTheTea.com and see for yourself. You can send us a testimony, but we just can't post it. Bummer. Our products are GMO-free and organic. We pride ourselves in being the best we can be, and we urge you to take charge of your health. We're 11 years strong, and many of our customers have shared their successes with friends and family. Protect your colon. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. 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 Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Win big with KGRA this summer. Tickets and hotel accommodations to the biggest conferences. Autograph books and DVDs. Chances to win all-inclusive conference cruises. And private dinners with your favorite KGRA hosts. Click the contest tab at KGRARadio.com for your chance to win big this summer. Your contact for the best alternative talk radio on the planet. KGRARadio.com. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Matthew, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. Harmio Sumi Church, very special night tonight. It is Fader Night, Thursday night, open lines with a very special guest. Barrett Brown is here. Okay, I laid it out in my little opening rant, and I think you get it. Barrett is a writer. He's an anarchist activist. His work has appeared in Vanity Fair, The Guardian, The Intercept, Huffington Post, New York Press, Skeptic, The Daily Beast, Al Jazeera, and dozens of other media outlets. 2009, he founded Project PM, a distributed think tank, which was later repurposed to oversee a crowdsourced investigation into the private espionage industry and the intelligence community at large via emails stolen from federal contractors and other sources. In 2011 and 2012, he worked with Anonymous, on campaigns involving the Tunisian Revolution, government misconduct, and all of those other issues. In mid-2012, he was arrested and later sentenced to four years in federal prison on charges stemming from his investigations and work with Anonymous. While in prison, though, he won the National Magazine Award for his column, The Barrett Brown Review of Arts and Letters and Prison. Upon his release in late 2016, he began work on the Pursuance System, platform for mass civic engagement and coordinated opposition. We're going to be talking about that tonight. And his third book, it's called My Glorious Defeats, will be released from Farr, Strauss, and Giro in February 2019. I would like to welcome to Fade to Black for the first time, Mr. Barrett Brown. Barrett, good evening, my friend. How are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you for having me on. It's uh, good to hear your voice, actually. When I spoke to you last week, I said, man, it's so good to hear your voice. So how are you doing? Let's actually get that out first. How are you today? Fantastic, fantastic. And uh, I I agree, my voice is always nice to hear. (laughs) And uh, um, you get the first-time guest disclaimer. Uh, You're going to be on with us uh, a lot in the future, and I look forward to that. But uh, tonight you get the first time guest disclaimer, which is Barrett. It's just you and I sitting on my couch, having a conversation as friends where it starts, it starts where it ends, it ends, but we're going to end as friends. There it is. You ready to go? That's very reassuring. Absolutely. Okay. Now I, I want to start with, uh, the present day and, and your mindset, and then we're going to go backwards, uh, for, for a little bit, but today, Did you ever, back in 2008, 2007, 2006, in your journalistic career, 
have any idea about the turmoil and the 1984 Aurelian nightmare that ended up unraveling and a journalist being arrested and that we would be talking about this stuff today. Did In your futuristic mind, did you think that this would have happened? You know, I, I guess I didn't, come to think of it. Uh, I had some pretty uh, severe ideas about what might happen to the American Republic uh, over the next couple of decades. Uh, but it, it didn't occur to me. You know, I was, I was a humor writer uh, in large part, in addition to being a journalist. And that's how I started out. And uh, this was a trajectory that kind of came about by a number of of uh, events, you know, that I, I could not have possibly uh, predicted. The uh, the vision of the future, which is something uh, largely, well, the humor side of it was always cool. And, it, and your personality came out that way. You were you were in demand. You were somebody that uh, all of uh, the publications wanted you to write for them. And did that affect things somewhat? In other words, did ego come into play as well, not only through your writing, but starting to face the man that you could take all of this on? I I always assumed that I've had very uh, megalomaniacal uh, tendencies since I was a small child. So. That part of it is actually pretty, uh, pretty in sync with everything else. Uh, it obviously, as I uh, started to look at the possibilities uh, of the Internet uh, as, as an adolescent, uh, there was there was a sense that there was this was a this was a uh, land grab, that this was something in which you could make yourself uh, without having to climb up the institutional ladders and all that or get a college degree or any of those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was something uh, it was very apparent to me that this was something uh, new and, and open uh, just like the old, you know, frontiers. It, it was exactly that. And then the other fascinating part about this, and I have asked Bella, I've asked Greg Hausch, uh, the same important question. I'm going to lay this out to you. Um, the man in general, the man didn't understand Anonymous, but Anonymous may not have understood Anonymous as well, in that what started off as lulls and laughter turned out to take down governments and countries, right? That's a whole other that's a whole nother thing. And did you envision uh that happening too as well? I did actually when I first came across the the uh sort of online venues from which Anonymous eventually sprung, which was 4chan.org. Uh, back in 2006, there was something there that that fascinated me uh, quite a bit. Uh, the 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 ability to uh, bring in and sort of harness large numbers of people very quickly and allow them to put their ideas into play and to act upon those ideas. Uh, this this was very new, and uh, even though it was being directed at that time uh, with these little sort of dada you know surreal pranks, uh, the 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 basic the basic uh, the basic ethos of this, the basic the basic structure around it, was kind of the same. It was basically here was a the, the, the big problem in the twenty first century is going to be how do you uh, arrange large numbers of people or allow them to self arrange uh, to some particular end. Now that that's possible for the first time in human history, and that was one of the early answers. It was it was an accidental answer. It was something that was not supposed to be an answer, uh, but it was something that that tells gives us the lesson that anything can become anything else for one thing and that there is a great deal we're going to see in the decades to come uh come out of these amorphous online movements they will give rise to all sorts of things and they're going to be very very hard for us to envision today even with the experience we have now going back uh th- th- this this question isn't the the simple one which is would you have done anything different no that's not the question the question is would you now knowing that you did go to prison that would you have done something more extreme anyway <laughs> right with, with did you hold back was there something else that you would have liked to have done back then that you know what you went to prison anyway. Was there something else that you could have driven some screws in? No, I can always go to prison again. Yeah, I'm pretty right. happy with the uh, balance I struck back then. The, the great thing about the DOJ coming after me in the way that they did right. uh, was that it was so it was so over overdone and so suspicious that even mainstream outlets that are generally not real quick on the uptake 
uh, figured out pretty quickly that this was retaliation for my investigative work into firms working with the government. And so they made the case for me and for the research that we did with Project PM and with some of these people from Anonymous, uh, they made the case for how important that stuff was uh, in a way that I never could. Any regrets? Uh, I would imagine so. But having said that, one never knows uh, what sort of uh, drawbacks and difficulties are going to later on open up new horizons. And that's certainly true for me. So I feel like I shouldn't regret anything. When you when you got released, I, I watched the film, right, and uh, that the the little short documentary, and I'm looking at your parents and specifically your mom, and now not to get any emotions out of you or anything, but you look at your mom who uh, and your dad, who are your parents and obviously love you, but I my blood boils that that is the tactic that the FBI took was to put pressure on you via your parents who are obviously uh, two of the coolest, groundest people out there. And that ignited a lot of your anger back then too, as well. How do you feel? Are, are you, a, do you, do you accept what they did or do you still, you know, boil just a little bit? Uh, that's something that, you know, I'll have plenty of time to to respond to in the future. I mean, I've, I've learned patience. Uh, you can't forgive a police agency that you already despised and which you already think is fundamentally uh, dangerous and deleterious to the things this country was supposed to be about. Uh, you can't forgive them on top of all that for going after your mother, for prosecuting your mother in order to try to get you to cooperate with them. It was uh, it was just a just a crazy story, and so let's actually go back and not uh, not getting really specific. We don't need to do that tonight. But as things started to let you know, we can go back actually uh, with uh, with Jeremy and uh, take a look at that part of things where. Obviously, you didn't know what was going on, the investigation um, and the way that they were doing things. Otherwise, it would have uh, ended differently. But did you have suspicions? Were you looking at some of these situations that they were closing in? Did you have any idea? Yes, there were a number of indications, uh, even aside from the usual sort of paranoia that, that always crops up whenever you're doing something that the FBI is probably uh, after you about. Uh, for one thing, there were there were. The time at the point I got involved with Anonymous to work on the Tunisian Revolution, uh, which was something that a lot of uh, Tunisians uh, were involved in on the Anonymous front, as in some of the uh, fellow who later on joined the provisional government was a member of our Anonops uh, server, from which a lot of this stuff was organized back then. At the time I joined, the FBI had just raided 40 households in the U.S. Uh, guns drawn, families uh, herded into the living room, all electronics taken. Uh, because of the DDoS attacks, the denial of service attacks that uh, a couple thousand people had participated in to knock down uh, MasterCard's sort of corporate website for a few seconds, uh, which didn't cause any uh, damage to the uh, the ability to process payments, by, by the way. Uh, a, a very minor, almost kind of a digital sit-in, and that elicited this massive nationwide police response and then simultaneous raids in Britain. So that was the situation when I got involved. It, the first things I you know, uh, was doing, aside from the Tunisia assistance program, was uh, getting lawyers for these people, uh, going to the National Lawyers Guild, going to uh, Jay Lederman, uh, going to some of these other uh, just sort of radical old attorneys and getting uh, identifying the people who had been raided and been putting them together. So I heard a lot from these people who had been raided about exactly what would happen. So there was never there was never a question that this was a path that led in one particular direction. And as time went on, as we started discovering things that were very uh, upsetting to the U.S. government, uh, there were more indications uh, that that you know that, that I was I would eventually be targeted. The the other part for me uh, on the outside looking in, it was uh, a harsh reality check for the FBI and all of those agencies that were looking into this that. It was decentralized, and this was something that they were used to organized crime, right? <laughs> the, the, right? right? The, the exact opposite is what they were dealing with here. Do you think right. they came down uh, also as hard as they did because, you know, they were just, uh, you know, pissed off 
that that they they couldn't they couldn't control this situation at all. That's that's a very strong possibility among among the many many slaps in the face that we gave not only them but also uh, the GCHQ in England and a number of uh, actual you know dictatorships and uh, just companies all over the world. Uh, you know, some, at one point, anonymous uh, got in on a, uh, a Interpol uh, FBI phone conference, recorded it, and posted it online a few minutes after it ended. And it was a bad, it, the conference was about anonymous, so that was embarrassing to the FBI. Uh, things like that, you know, if, if any, if you've ever dealt with authority figures, uh, you know that uh, to to injure them in some way uh, is to invite retribution. Right. And there was a great deal of injury, uh, you know, in their direction during that period. The you know, so, so it, it would be it would have been surprising had they not uh, reacted probably because of that. But also from a policy standpoint, from the standpoint of a government or from people who basically just sort of accept uh, that degree of authoritarian governments as necessary. Something like anonymous that, that comes out of nowhere and, and is at one year raiding video game servers and making little little memes. Right. And, and a few years later is taking down is helping to take down the Tunisian government. And then a year later, you got the NSA director saying these people will be able to take out power plant soon. He was, he was lying about that. I don't think he really believed that. But it was something that the, the, the trajectory, I'm sure, was very alarming to a lot of people. And so, OK, so now take us up to that day of the arrest. Uh, again, it's not so much about uh, the sensationalism of it. But there was it was it was a live video feed too. I wanted to ask you about that. Were you anticipating uh, anything on that specific day? Yes, I was. Uh, for one thing, first of all, they had raided me uh, without arresting me in my mom's house as well, and took in uh, electronics, all that. They left a search warrant, which Michael Hastings uh, put up on BuzzFeed. After that, it's still up there. Where you can see the exact companies they were looking into: it was HP Gary, In Game Systems, uh, our website on which we compiled our information about these companies. And my group, Project PM, that was the that was always the point of this. That's that's you know the the, the search the secret search warrant started shortly after we revealed all this stuff to the public. Um, so and then I was I received uh, sort of a tip uh, on March fifth, two thousand. I'm sorry, not March fifth. Yeah, March fifth, two thousand twelve. About that raid, uh, I did, was not tipped off about the actual the next raid, which is about six seven months later when they stormed my. Uh, apartment with a SWAT team. That was something that took me by surprise. And that, I think that comes across in the recording that's online. And, and what, what, what ultimately did they do there? Did you think that this was, uh, did you have any idea like this was your last day of freedom, uh, for a number of years? Did you think you were uh, going to get released later on that day? You know, not really. Uh, after in the aftermath, after the raid, which was, you know, went very quickly, uh, it, it occurred to me. Well, actually, you know, what, at first I thought, you know, I know exactly what these guys are going to charge me with, and I know it's nonsense. So surely it should be easy for me, a journalist uh, who has a, a megaphone, to bring that to public attention. And I'm sure the courts work the same way. And so I was very naive. I didn't realize I had never really dealt with uh, the federal courts before, and I knew in the abstract that the DOJ is a very imperfect entity. Uh, but I did not know. Uh, very much at all compared to what I know now about that system. How much of it can you discuss right now? Am I free to just ask whatever? No, certainly. Okay. Yes, any, anything. Okay. Did they offer that first day, Barrett, did they offer you a deal to flip? No, they hadn't actually even charged me. Uh, there was It was a criminal complaint they used to come raid me, and then they had 30 days to come up with some, some charges, and they charged me with threatening a federal agent uh, based on my comment that I was going to investigate this guy. Uh, in the same way that this uh, intelligence contractor had uh, plotted under the DOJ with their uh, approval uh, to investigate the families of activists. So I knew it wasn't a violent threat. I knew it didn't violate the statute. So when those charges came, I was still, you know, like, well, you know, there's there's plenty of, of I can get out of this. But no, that the, the FBI, uh, after those first charges, about a month after, you know, I was I was in jail this whole time, they did approach my first attorney, who was a public defender, and said that if he, you know, tell him that, if he wants any kind of plea bargain, as in if he doesn't want to go to trial and, and go do 20 years, he's going to have to make a deal. And I just told him no, and I got new lawyers. Uh, in the process of raising the money for those lawyers, the DOJ then came and uh, tried to seize that money. Uh, they not only seized the money, uh, or, or tried to seize the money, they, they shut it down for a few days, and the judge eventually let, made them give it back. 
But in the process, they also sent a subpoena to WePay, which was the crowdsourced funding site that was being used for my legal fund. And they demanded the uh, identifying information of everyone who had donated, which is well beyond their purview. Later on, they got sued for that years later when it, be- when it became evident. But uh, so this, this was this was a, this was a situation in which some crazy new thing would happen every couple of weeks. There was some like a gag order. There would be accusations from them and filings. They would they would uh, they called my new lawyers before they were actually my lawyers and kind of which is something that's not just not done. Uh, it was there was always new information and new concerns and new threats. So it was really hard to assess at any given time what I was in for. Now, they made one more offer uh, later on uh, after they had charged me with these other. Uh, I'll, I'll let you go into that since we're sort of moving forward on that one. But uh, they did eventually try to get me to plea to one count of uh, aggravated identity theft uh, as opposed to the 11 counts they had hit me with. Uh I was facing a minimum of 22 years in prison on top of the other charges, uh, altogether facing 105 years worth of exposure. Uh, they offered me to, to plead to one of those counts of fraud, and I turned them down uh, because I would, I would never plead a fraud. Now, I certainly wouldn't plead a fraud in that context. It was, it was, had I done so, they would have been able to prosecute anyone who links to stolen information uh, in the future. So. And, and it, all of this sounds so criminal. And so you were just a journalist, you know, and that's the other part about it. You know, being a spokesman or not for anonymous, really, you know, we're we're talking about a journalist with a career that was doing these things to disrupt. But ultimately, that is what we're talking about here. But they wanted to make this into something that it wasn't. And that's exactly what they do. Was it? Uh, looking back, did they ever scare you? Did they intimidate you with these, with these charges and with these, you know, uh, a century in prison kind of thing? Oh, certainly. I mean, I, I spent two and a half years uh, in pre-trial and detention, uh, so there's plenty of time to think. Oh my, am I, am I just, am I overestimating my abilities here? Have, have I gotten into something that I can't get out of? Right. Uh, pl- plenty of time to reflect on that. Uh, but ultimately, we developed a plan uh, that would not only uh, hopefully get me out of prison at some point in the, in the, in the medium future, uh, but also finish our work, bring a great deal more of attention to these companies, uh, and essentially use the DOJ for that end. As in, obviously, everything they did was another opportunity to go out there and say, here's the search warrant listing these firms. These are the firms that Barrett Brown was investigating and wrote about, uh, and in some cases exposed uh, their private programs. Uh, this is what they were after him for. This is what the search warrants actually say. These other things are red herrings, and that's the case. And and so it, we were effective enough in that that everyone from the New York Times, you know, New York Times ran two op eds, both saying, you know, this is retaliatory charges. Uh, Washington Times, uh, mainstream outlets that again normally are not very good on picking up on these nuances. Uh, this time they did pick it up, and so ultimately we put a pretty big dent uh, in their credibility, and uh, I think opened a wi- opened the window a little bit wider. Uh, towards these intelligence apparatus. So, and of course, by that time, Snowden, uh, you know, while I was still in jail, Snowden uh, came out and that uh, changed the conversation further. So all in all, it was a pretty good couple of years for uh, intelligence contracting journalism. Now, and there is uh, also to clear things up, let's put something on the record. I want the audience to understand ultimately what came down here, what which was Stratfor which wasn't in the original set of charges, but that's ultimately which you were convicted on, correct? Right. So what had happened was we had these hackers and anonymous had originally hacked these other companies, HP Gary and all that. And we exposed a bunch of stuff. And, and those were really the, the emails they took from that company, which had, had claimed it, it could identify our secret leadership, you know, quote unquote. Uh, the emails that they took were, were instrumental in, in thwarting several very bizarre plots, including uh uh, attacks on WikiLeaks, uh, the setting up of activists on fraud charges, uh, DDoS attacks of the same sort that Anons get raided for and arrested and charged for all the time. Uh, and then later on, eight months later, so while we're now in, now focused on these companies, uh, there's another hack that, that Jeremy Hammond, another anonymous hacker, is involved in, and that some of the people uh, in my Project PM group were also uh, aware of. And that was a hack of Stratford, which is a firm in Austin that, that uh, supposedly you know, was in the business of providing sort of risk assessment to their uh, high-end clientele and that sort of thing. It turns out, based on the emails that were stolen this time and later given to WikiLeaks, that uh, this firm was uh, spying, for instance, on activists in Bhopal, India, who were trying to get Union Carbide to pay more restitution to the people that they had uh, maimed 
or left family members dead in the 1980, you know, Bhopal disaster, uh, the Dow Chemical deal, uh, that sort of thing. They were collaborating with the FBI uh, against private citizens. The, the, the FBI was giving their files to this private company uh, at the behest of their clients, like Coca-Cola, for instance. Uh, just very bizarre stuff. All, all you know, any any one of which of these stories, uh, I think, should have been an eye opener uh, for people. But anyway, so that 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 hack was what they originally decided to charge me in connection with. Uh, and, uh, you know, at first they charged me with having copied and pasted a link that Jeremy Hammond had posted into one of these anonymous uh, chat servers where we do a lot of this work. I had copied the link, pasted it into my Project PM IRC, Internet Relay Chat Server, for my journalists and researchers to look at, thinking it was some of the emails. Mm-hmm. And it turned out those were credit card numbers. And, and as you can see from the transcript, which was part of the core record, uh, it was pretty clear that I didn't know those were credit card numbers. I asked him what was in those. Uh, you know, he says, oh, he says it's like B and C, something like some jargon. I'm like, oh, OK, whatever. Government forensics show I never opened the file. Uh, they were already. Anyways, it, it was just it was one of those things where it was just they had they had to charge me with something. And they know that even if it's untenable and, of course, they had to drop all those charges, all 11 of those counts for, for a number of reasons. But, uh, you know, it was just something to charge me with. Now, eventually what I pled to. Uh, after after they had to drop those charges, uh, which was a real uh, embarrassment to them because it was the centerpiece of their case, uh, they wanted me to plead to something, uh, something in connection with, uh, you know, the year of activity with Anonymous. So what I pled to was accessory after the fact for the Stratford hack, because what I did was when the, not, when the hack had initially occurred and when Jeremy Hammond and a few other people were debating about what to do with these emails they had taken – uh, a couple of us were arguing that you, you don't dump them online. We don't know what's in them. There could be information in there that could get someone hurt, perhaps informants uh, under a foreign dictatorship you know, who, who spoke to them. Uh, and so I called the, the company, Stratford, called its executives uh, on the phone and offered to handle any redactions that needed to be made if these emails were to go, indeed be dumped online. And uh, that is ultimately what... And it's something that, that the DOJ never mentioned in its earlier filings. But by the time we got into this two-year process of them having to drop all these charges, uh, that was enough for them. So when you hear people who are national security enthusiasts uh, talk about how their big concern is that innocent people might get hurt from these dumps, uh, keep in mind that that's what I tried to do. I tried to rectify that, and that's what they used against me. They don't really care uh, if someone gets killed over this. They, they, it's helpful to them. It helps make their case and helps, uh, helps them argue for more and more classification. Now, we're going to head towards a break here in about 90 seconds, so I'll see if I can get a quick answer out of you. It To me and to others, the strat for hack and the way that it was done was really a sting operation, wasn't it? Wasn't it more like uh, entrapment? It, it was It was something that had actually initiated with some, some run-of-the-mill criminal hackers, I think, out of Eastern Europe, and they had taken control of the server secretly at some point. And then at some point that uh, control was handed over in parts to other people who made it, that made it way, way too anonymous. So there were several people, including myself, who knew that Strapper was compromised. Right. Uh, one of the people who knew it was Sabu, Hector Monsegur, who was one of the, the major anonymous hackers who had been involved in these previous hacks that had yielded all these emails, and who, unbeknownst to us, uh, had been secretly discovered, found, identified, and turned by the FBI uh, seven months prior. So this strap for hack and everything else that Sabu presided over uh, was allowed to happen by the FBI. And that is the that's the part that's the I, that that is that's the real criminal activity here. And it's something that has been s- discussed, but not <laughs> exploited. I'm sorry I had to say that word, but it's really the true part about this Sabu. This was entrapment. It was entrapment uh, through and through. There wasn't any way to, well, obviously there wasn't, but wasn't there a legal way looking back to to take advantage of the entrapment part of this and have all of this go away? There were all sorts of things very much like that. I mean, you're absolutely right. That and, and several other aspects, including uh, information they concealed from my lawyers and which ended up in the press after I was sentenced, uh, showing, showing again that I had no intention of, of uh, you know, of, of losing credit card numbers, uh, that should have been introduced. Uh, we had a legal team that involved several different people who did not necessarily mesh well, and some some things that were you know pretty major were actually lost in the cracks. And uh, I tried to bring up a lot of them myself in my uh, allocution when I spoke to the judge for ten minutes, uh, which we made public. 
But, you know, that's just not enough. And, and this judge in particular was just not – he was not terribly fastidious about making sure that uh, we're doing things by the book. And that's not unusual among federal judges, unfortunately. Yeah, the crime was allowed to happen. If if the FBI – we're going to take a break right here – but if the FBI was really – uh, on the up and up and honest, which they're not, of course, but they would not have allowed the crime to happen and allow all of these uh, individuals to go to prison. It's an incredible situation. Our guest tonight, Barrett Brown. This is Fade to Black, a very special Fader night. We're going to continue this discussion when we come back after this short break. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. More with Barrett right after this. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Does your basement or crawl space have a damp, musty smell? Well, watch out. That's a sign of too much moisture and not enough ventilation. And that can mean increased mold growth and the buildup of harmful toxins and gases. Don't bother with a dehumidifier. It just circulates the same unhealthy air. Now there's a better way to remove these dangers and odors. It's with the computerized Wave Moisture Control Unit that reduces moisture and expels pollutants. We replaced our old dehumidifier with the Wave Unit, and in only three weeks, our basement is dry and the musty smell is gone. Wave units require no maintenance, no buckets of water or filters, and costs only pennies a day to run. Breathe better, live healthier with an affordable, no maintenance Wave unit. Call 888-717-WAVE 888-717-WAVE or visit dryhealthyhome.com dryhealthyhome.com Ride the wave Wave Home Solutions For a healthy, comfortable home Hi, this is Ray Hobbs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> we are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. <laughs> All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Very special Fader night tonight. We have Barrett Brown here. We're going to open up the phone lines at the bottom of the hour, 323-825-5045. So get ready for that. I'm not opening up the phone lines yet, so don't start dialing, but we'll do that at the bottom of the hour. And uh, Barrett, uh, okay, prison's behind you. You're walking out. You've got your your bags. You're you're walking out of prison. Your mom is there to greet you. As you left, and that door closes behind you, what went through your mind at that point? Uh, okay, that really sucked. I'm never coming back. I'm reformed. Did that thought go through your mind? I mean, what as you were walking up to your mom, what were you thinking about? Assumed that I think the uh, the prison was the prison staff themselves were were pretty certain that they'd see me again someday. And uh, you know I, I was I was I had already been on record uh, doing interviews from prison uh, about what I would be doing when I left, and that of course was uh, was starting the pursuance project. And, and uh, the the emotional part of of seeing your parents again. Uh, we're going to move on from this right now, but I would just want to get inside of your mind because when you're in prison for for that length of time, 
now being, you know, free. Well, you're on your way to a halfway house. You're not exactly free. But um, what was that like? Did 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 you have any issues with uh, reality? I mean, because now you can do things like walk around and change your mind and not have somebody around you and 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 the confinement part. You're free again. Does that take a little bit of uh, uh, adjusting? Yeah, readjusting back to civilian life was harder than adjusting to prison in the first place. I can only imagine. I can only imagine that there was a, a shot of you um, uh, where you guys stopped at like a truck stop or something when you were driving to the halfway house and you were uh, uh, like in a bathroom, I think. You know what I'm talking about. But I, I it looked to me like you were you were right there like, wow, okay. It, 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 you weren't comfortable, I guess is the best way to put it. You weren't, were you? Oh, no, not at all. For one thing, we had we had a certain amount of time to get to get from the, the border of Mexico, where my prison was in South Texas, to Dallas. And they originally did not give us sufficient time. And I happen to know from talking to other inmates that they will put out another warrant for you if you are late and unaccounted for at that halfway house. So I had, first I had to argue for more time that we would have seven hours to drive uh, this thing that takes about seven hours. And, uh, you know, we were there making a documentary about me at the time. So we had a lot, uh, you know, a lot to worry about. And uh, having said that, just in general, the, the halfway house, uh, I was not excited about that. Uh, and I actually considered staying in prison for the last six months rather than take that halfway house time. The reason they gave me so much halfway house time, which is six months is actually pretty unusual these days, is to get me out of there because uh, I was filing a lot of administrative remedy uh Administrative remedy forms uh, based on due process violations. Obviously, I was writing a column uh, that was pretty popular and won the National Magazine Award uh, about that prism and about uh, the BOP in general. So they didn't want me there. Uh, but, you know, the halfway house, you, you have to go to a whole nother thing. And now it's, you know, you, it doesn't have the same uh, charms as prison halfway house. I'll tell you that. It's the same charms. Okay. <laughs> wow. Uh, okay. Okay. Now let's, uh, let's go to today. Um, since your release, which was November, 2016, the, you have seen, uh, this country go through some, the world goes through, through some crazy things with not only internet privacy, certainly WikiLeaks and, and emails, uh, data mining, uh, fake news, uh, crazy controlled journalism with an agenda, all of the things that you had warned us about in your writings leading up to 2016. Um, here we are today. What Does anything surprise you right now where we are with the Internet, privacy, journalism, mass media, and fake news? Uh, I'm mostly the one thing that keeps surprising me is the extent to which people ha have just given up on nuance. Uh, it's very difficult for me to make an argument that someone could look at and rec and and believe it is on route to another argument. As in, if I say, "Look, the FBI is corrupt. Look at this," people think that I'm uh, supporting Trump. Uh, if I say the exact op if I say, you know. Uh, something on the exact opposite uh, of the sort of party line, people will just take that and extrapolate from it. So it's very hard to say, look, you know, uh, you know these these organizations, the DOJ, the FBI, uh, the CIA, we should not be uh, we should not be cozying up to them, uh, regardless of what you know what you think of the investigation. Uh, these are not fundamentally sound uh, groups. They never really have been. Uh, they've differed. So it's it's uh, people have become, I think, more intellectually dishonest. Uh, I think I think obviously people have gotten the opportunity to uh, avoid uh, reasoned criticism uh, of their positions by going online and just reading, you know, a certain array of of people who think like them. And they have uh, they have not availed themselves of the opportunity to to uh, look at look at all the facts and, and judge both positions on any issue before making up their mind. And that, that's something that was already happening. Uh, but the extent to which that's gotten worse, uh, that, that that's what's horrified me most. It, it 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 seems to have happened pretty quickly. Now it be, it built up to this point for for you know a couple of decades, but certainly the divisiveness and the effectiveness of of different uh, media platforms out there with the internet to divide and cause this anger 
and, and and the anger now is everywhere. Is there a way to pull it back and get everybody back on the same page? No, I don't think there is. I think uh, I think we were ill served by all of the rhetoric about this being one nation, and we're all you know deep down where we we have fundamental things in common. We really don't. There, there's this is a fractured nation, and there's no reason to expect that it shouldn't be. Uh, there there are not fundamentals in which everyone agrees on. It's just not the case. And so I, I think the best strategy going forward is for uh, those people who agree on these sort of open society ideas uh, in general, they're opposed to the surveillance state, opposed to the police state, uh, sort of things of that nature, should work together more efficiently, uh, figure out how they can uh, address their fundamentals and how they organize, how, how, they, how they try to affect change, uh, and just sort of prepare, prepare for whatever may happen. The the warnings were there, right? The warnings were there, like uh, 1984, Brave New World, and other, we all knew that this day could arrive, but we considered it brilliant writing in science fiction. I don't think anybody is surprised where we are today that we are here, but we indeed are, and these things have come to pass and it seems like nobody wants to do anything about it. Well, except for yourself and, and me. I, I, don't, I don't get it why everybody was aware of it, but now they don't want to do anything. I think civic virtue, uh, whether it be the forms that we may agree with or disagree with, you know, just the, the, uh, the impulse to act at self-risk if necessary – that was something that was very much in play in the 60s and 70s on, on both sides, right. uh, whether it be Nixon's people or, or the you know, anti-war people and civil rights. People were, were more willing to do unusual, adventurous things if they thought it was necessary. Uh, that's something that is that is slowly just deteriorated in this country, uh, as far as I can tell. From, you know, I was born in 1981, so what do I know? But from what I can tell and from what I can hear from people who were around, uh, this is a different population. People are different. People my age in particular uh, – you know, the Internet, which I have obviously, de- you know, depend upon for the things I want to do, I think it does have a very deleterious effect on the, the adventurism, the, 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 the adventurism that was the norm back in the 18th and 19th centuries. And now there's another fascinating thing about this that not only that you write about, but I think we're all becoming very aware is that in the 18th and 19th century, certainly going all the way up to the 80s, before the Internet, it was a slow process for change or to affect emotions. It was it was slow. A lot of it was even word of mouth or flyers or magazines and, and that kind of thing. Today, it is down to nanoseconds, where you have millions of people that are reacting literally at the click of a mouse worldwide. That is something that is completely spun out of control, and the man and and the media outlets understand this. It's a nanosecond away from crazy emotions. There, there are there are several just vastly fundamental changes uh, of the sort we've never seen this degree of that have come into play, uh, sort of all centered around the internet since I was born. Uh, historically speaking. You know, going from the 1980s situation where you do have you have international phone calls and you have letters and, and all that, we're kind of a, we consider ourselves a connected world. Uh, going to 15, 20 years later, it is it is a fundamental difference in the environment to have anyone in the world be able to collaborate with anyone else in the world. That is something that had human history. Have we always had that power? Have we had some kind of telepathy whereby you could have uh, organized with people in China from Britain in 1400? The entire Obviously, the entire history, our history would be vastly different. So suddenly this is coming to play. Suddenly this is now possible. And a lot of people haven't really thought about what that means. There are some people who think about it very much. And those are the people at, at DARPA, IARPA, uh, some of these companies uh, that, are, that are sort of given the task of uh, managing the government's response to the things that they think are going to come down the pike. Let's uh, talk about what you are doing now uh, with the Pursuance uh, Project. Tell us about that, because this addresses all of these changes that are possible. Yeah, I mean, th- these are basically the issues that I'm obsessed with, uh, the inf- issues of, of and the broad issue of, yes, now we can now collaborate. Now things are fundamentally different. The nation state, the, the, the geographical you know, associationism that is informed all of our structures, all of our political institutions, they all date back from when it made sense to work with your neighbors. 
uh, and there was no other option. And so these these institutions, they've come into the, they've continued on to this age and they've changed a bit. Uh, but most of them are not capable of changing fundamentally and, and adapting to these new realities. And so, you know, some of them will do better than others. Uh, in the meantime, those of us who uh, are keen on history and are thus worried about what might be happening soon, uh, you know, even, even, the, even the things that have been going on in the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, I think pales compared to what may very well happen in the next 20 years. And so those of us who want who, who look at it that way, who think that these are times in which profound change can occur and, and either will, will be will be done by others who we may disagree with or will be done by us. Uh, we have sort of a responsibility to uh, approach this question, this, this key problem in the 21st century, which is how you organize large numbers of people that you agree with in some basic way and get them to act uh, in a way that's not just fun and you know histrionic. It doesn't involve just going in the streets and shouting and holding signs, but that really uh, can grow perpetually while refining itself, uh, never becoming overburdened you know, while still being able to grow quickly and adapt. Uh, that's what the pursuance system that we're building uh, is intended to do for people who believe in the open society, who are opposed to authoritarian governments. Uh, uh, this is this is sorry. Oh, I was going to say, give me an example of uh, of a project. Yes. So this is something that is that is geared towards a couple of different constituencies, one of which is the people like those anonymous or telecomics or these other groups that were sort of on the cutting edge of of working together online against uh uh, criminalized institutions uh, and, and thinking up new effective ways of doing that. This is a way of letting them uh, organize in a more uh, effective way th- than the amorphous kind of uh, haphazard ways that we did with Anonymous and some of these other things back then. It's also a way for existing institutions, uh, you know, groups that are out fighting for civil liberties, uh, you know, imposing transparency on government to better make use of the people who support their causes, to not just have them uh, uh, sign petitions and make donations. But to get them arrayed into a sort of self-organized uh, network that can grow again and sort of uh, uh, become a real uh, a real asset to those groups and, and to have them work together, and as well as journalists, uh, we want journalists to be able to use this for crowdsourcing, which is a which is a very powerful tool that we used to good effect uh, in 2011. You know, we did it such a good job that the FBI came down on us. Uh, so these these are some of the basic uses. But one specific example that I'll be uh, involved in to give an example of what this kind of this thing can do, uh, we'll be putting together a prison reform project. We're going to be creating a information package for journalists in regional markets, for local newspapers, that kind of thing, local television stations, and teaching them how to cover prisons effectively by using FOIA requests for uh, the the grievance forms that inmates file in prisons when they want to go to court. You know, pr- inmates aren't allowed to just write to a judge and say, hey, I'm being kept in a cell and beaten every day, and they haven't told me why. They have to go through this process that Congress uh, laid on us back in 1996, whereby the prison itself gets to oversee the process. So they have to say, okay, you've turned this in on time, and we're definitely going to you know, put that in the record, and we're going to submit it to the next branch of the BOP, so on and so forth. All the state prisons have this. Uh, the federal prison has it. So those, as I documented in my column, uh, tend not to go very far. You could have expected that if you had thought, you know, if you thought about, you know, uh, how how viable is a uh, self defense mechanism that relies on your enemy to function. And, and so we're going to be uh, working with journalists uh, to to we're going to show them that not only can they can they effectively and, and crucially cover these prisons, uh, cover what's going on in him, but also do it in a way that helps them. And that's very important when you're dealing with a lot of journalists, and most of them are careerists. So we're always keen to point out that this will make your job easier. So there's a number of projects like that that are intended to like take people who have these skills and want to help do something and get them arrayed into something where they can, they can decide the terms of their involvement and then grow and interact with something else that's broken. So if you think of pursuance, uh, if you think of, a, of a, the state or any institution as a big old building that's kind of crumbling in some places, uh, maybe it has cracks in the foundation, maybe it needs a paint job, you don't all have to agree on what needs to be done with the building ultimately in order to start building scaffolding around it and get together on the parts that with the ones that you all agree on. Uh, the other thing about scaffolding is you can affix nets to it. So when the building starts crumbling down in the future, uh, bricks won't fall on people below. That's what pursuance is for states. 
And could could it also, uh, I envision, environmental issues and, and, and tackling that and, and taking on those big corporations that uh, are messing with the environment or maybe fracking or maybe plant some trees and or, you, you know what I mean? Is there... It, oh, it absolutely. Does, it doesn't uh, matter, and, right? It doesn't matter. It's just whatever yeah, yeah. you want to pursue. It, it is. It is essentially an organizing platform. It's a platform for mass civic collaboration. It's it's uh, it's it's we call it process democracy. So all the participants uh, and participants, you know, come in by invitation from existing participants. That's how it grows over time. And of course, it will grow exponentially uh, like those things do. Uh, they decide what they're going to work on. They, anyone who comes in can create this pursuance, which is this living organizational co- chart sort of thing. Uh, and this ecosystem arises where all these different projects are taking shape, and the, you can see what they are uh, to the extent that they're they're visible. So, you know, obviously some projects are more, need more security than others, but uh, it, it'll be much easier in this ecosystem to find the people that you want to work with and find the people with the skills that you need and offer them a position in this little group you've started. Uh, than it is anywhere else. It'll be more secure as well since it's end-to-end encrypted. Uh, you know, nothing is 100% secure, but we have additional layers that are just not available to uh, people who are using Slack right now for these things or Facebook. You know, Right, right. Uh, uh, where can right. everybody go check out uh, the project right now? Pursuanceprojects.org. It's P-U-R-S-U-A-N-C-E project.org. That's uh, where you can find some diagrams kind of showing what we mean by when we say a pursuance. It's obviously something that's, that's hard to... Uh, explain just verbally, but uh, you, you can see what we're doing. You can see what kind of uses it can be put to. Uh, you can see examples of what certain organizations like Frontline Wellness, which is a uh, nonprofit that goes and provides medical training in, in conflict resolution in conflict zones around the world. You, you can see examples and kind of get a better idea of what the possibilities are here. But basically anything you can envision uh, as someone who supports the free society, if you just agree to these basic principles, anything you envision, anything you want to work on, uh, the odds are that there's going to be someone working on something similar. So you can join their pursuance or start your own. Uh, it's it's something that's very, very universal, very scalable. Uh, you know, ultimately, this is not a content neutral system. We're not trying to empower cops or Nazis. Uh, but we are, you know, any, anyone who agrees on, on these basic precepts uh, that we list uh, is welcome. Now, you've been envisioning this. This isn't something that just happened overnight either. Uh, you've been looking at this structure and and applying this for how long? The, the first the first iteration of, of Pursuance was uh, what I set up Project PM to do in 2009. And we had some main – I had recruited a bunch of people using my columns that I had in HuffCompost and Skeptical Inquirer in different places saying, look, I'm going to build this thing. And if you're in, let me know. My editors were horrified by this because you know it seemed very silly to them. This, this guy is – calling for this big civic platform, cyberpunk thing, whatever. Uh, but I did it anyway. And so we got a number of people who were all very sort of early adapter types. Uh, oddly enough, my second in command at that point was a I- former IRS lawyer. So it was a mainstream uh, group. Uh, then I got involved with Anonymous and because the Tunisia thing was happening. And then the things one thing led to another. And that all fell by the way- wayside. But in the meantime, obviously, I, I had the opportunity to learn quite a bit about both the, the broad lessons – of online organization and human organization uh, in general, and the little mundane things that, that you know you really you kind of pick up after a while and, and apply all of these things uh, into this system. So the system we have now, the way this works now, is far more refined than what we were originally putting together. But even that was uh, it, it, it was useful enough uh, to those who saw it that we we had no problem recruiting for it. And this this is obviously vastly better, which is why we have a board of directors with some uh, pretty uh, High caliber figures like Brigitte Jan's daughter, a uh, member of parliament from Iceland who was formerly involved with WikiLeaks, uh, John Kiriakou, who uh, blew the whistle on CIA torture and also went to prison, uh, a number of uh, college professors, uh, journalists, that sort of thing. Uh, we have, we have, we don't just have an idea that I'm going to sit here and say, oh, if everyone did this, you know, it'd be great. We have the means to get people in and use it. And that's that's the important part that I always want to make clear, because, you know, there, there are great ideas out there. There's things like liquid democracy. There's all kinds of software platforms for organizing. The problem is because of just the goofiness of, of how we uh, prioritize what we're going to do, uh, they don't get a lot of media pickup. Uh, so we do have this opportunity to ensure that, you know, beyond the 1900 people and organizations that have signed up thus far, that over the coming couple of years, uh, we bring in 30, 40,000 high caliber people with different skills, different backgrounds, uh, different means of acquiring information 
and let them work out exactly what they're going to do. Does uh, does this kind of thing that you have gone through, I don't want to be loose with what I'm trying to say here, but I'm talking about the big picture. It, it, do you feel like it's restricted your opportunities out there for journalism now? Have those calls stopped or uh, is the phone off the hook? Well, it's, it's both. They have the DOJ has made it very difficult for me. Uh, they rearrested me uh, last year uh, when I was still uh, on uh, uh, halfway house, basically on, on uh, I forgot the term for it. Wasn't on probation yet. Uh, had me rearrested because I gave an interview to Vice, another one to PBS, and they claimed that I wasn't allowed to give interviews. I happen to know for a fact, uh, since I had given them from prison, for instance, over the phones a number of times, uh, and was familiar with the actual guidebook on that for, for inmates. But I was allowed to, and I told them, no, I'm not going to get your permission to give interviews. And they rearrested me. A uh, publisher down here paid eleven thousand dollars to a law firm to threaten them uh, to take it to court, and they let me out immediately. Uh, then they subpoenaed the Intercept, which I used to write for. They subpoenaed my publishers and my my agents uh, for the book that I've got that, of course, has a lot of uh, embarrassing DOJ material beyond what's already available. And they subpoenaed them for all my communications between them and the editors and also demanded that they not pay me my book advance until further notice. And that further notice turned out to be quite further indeed. So just yesterday, after a year, uh, I got my net my my income, the income I've been waiting for for a year. So they've definitely done what they can to stymie this operation, uh, particularly pursuance. Uh, they, they know that I was planning and had already started sort of self-funding it uh, from the get-go. Uh, and, and so they sort of prevented me from being able to do that. Luckily, we have volunteers that uh, care enough about this, that they have done this stuff with no money and in some cases even uh, put in their own to uh, go to conferences and that kind of thing. So uh, on the other hand, obviously, if you, anyone who Googles my name, they're going to see a great deal of material about the things that I that I called correctly. Uh, they're going to see, you know, that uh, I have certain unusual qualities for a journalist. One of which is that I that I uh, don't just want to be a journalist. I don't want I don't want to just have readers. I want to have constituents, uh, and that obviously makes it easier. It makes me more credible uh, having the the awards and all that that I wouldn't have gotten if I wasn't hadn't gone to prison. Uh, that helps me with mainstream people uh, and. and it's kept my credibility up among those, you know, the less mainstream. And that's that's been very important to doing this, to putting this together. A, a very big part of this is getting people's attention in the first place. Uh, another big part of it is being able to get uh, prominent figures to come out and endorse it and uh, to work on it and serve on a board of directors. And those are things that I just would not have been able to do to that extent uh, had the DOJ not come after me in the way they did. Well, you ready to take some phone calls after this break? Absolutely. Let's do it. Uh, let me uh, fire this up. Our guest tonight on this wonderful Fader Night, Barrett Brown is here. All right, I'm going to open up the phone lines after this short break. 323-825-5045. It is Fader Night. It's open lines. Barrett Brown is here. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRA Radio.com. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzanel, tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires. This year we've experienced more than our fair share. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. And last month I decided to make sure my family does not have to worry about food should we get caught in a real emergency situation. Introducing Numana, a healthy, storable product that tastes so good that you'll want to eat it every day instead of just during those times of duress. All new Mana products have a 25-year shelf life, are MSG and GMO-free, no preservatives, and are made in America. With the new Mana pack in your home, you'll be able to sleep at night knowing that you've protected your family. Not only have I tasted and tested, I own it. Now you can too. 
Just click on the new Mana banner on JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code Jimmy when you order. In addition to a discount, we'll send you an autographed Fade to Black t-shirt. Seriously, go Beckley Tappy. Do you worry a lot whether you're a college student, busy professional, parent, or grandparent, ongoing stress and elevated levels of the stress hormone cortisol can rob your memory, your health, and your future. Now you can combat the effects of stress and anxiety while improving your memory and recall at the same time with the dietary supplement Calm and Clever. Studies show that the ingredients in Calm and Clever reduce cortisol by as much as 30% in one to two weeks. Call 1-800-758-8746 or calmandclever.com. You listen to us, and we listen to you, and so does the CIA. (laughs) KGRARadio.com You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Fade to Black. I'm your Simi Church. It's Fader Night. It's now open lines. 323-825-5045. Our special guest tonight is Barrett Brown. And uh, all right, Barrett, you ready to do this? Absolutely. I was uh, born ready. Let's, <laughs> you know, uh, everything that we deal with on the show, which is conspiracy the man the new world order and ufos and ghosts and spirituality and and all parallel worlds and time travel you never know what these phone calls are going to be like so let's uh let's see what we have first hi you're live on fade to black who's calling hey jimmy it's uh it's me it's zoni zoni yeah okay zoni how are you I'm good. How are you? Uh, I'm doing good. Say hi to Barrett. How are you, Barrett? How are you tonight? I'm fantastic. I'm always fantastic. What did you have for Barrett? Um, um, well, I will let I'll let Barrett start. Um, I'm not. I'm always good at answering questions, not really asking them. Good. I'm going to ask you this. We have a Kickstarter going on for this pursuance project we've been talking about. This is everyone. Uh, out there who is a former whistleblower who was involved in fighting for the free society uh, with their skin in the game, they all agree that this is the best way forward. So we have three days left. How much money are you going to put into this Kickstarter? <laughs> um, I don't have any money. <laughs> well, there you go. I, I have I have five dollars in my PayPal account. Um, who who, who, who has really money you're going to approach care. and say, hey, there's a really, thing called really pursuance. You've got to look money. into it. Okay, one at a time here. I'm sorry, Barrett. Excuse me. Uh, that's okay. What Barrett said was, we need to get the word out. You need to let your friends know too, as well. Bang that's this right. out um, and retweet and uh, and get it out there for us. I shall do that right now because I'm sitting in front of my computer, guys. Um, you tweet so, and I'll retweet your tweet. How's that? I just retweeted your tweet, Jimmy, about uh, Barrett Brown's pursuance project and i read up on it a bit and i i I like the idea very much um i need to read more in depth about it but i'm i'm with you guys all the way thank you so much zoni and behave and be well i'll retweet your retweet okay thank you so much guys thank you for the time thanks for accepting my call yeah thank you and uh you know barrett there's uh that it's going back to the spirituality side of things. You had a long time to contemplate about, you know, yourself, your life, the past, and what the future could be. 
did you did you have any type of uh uh you know did did the, did you see the light did things uh take off assalamu alaikum no, no i'm, I'm just be, kidding. I'm, be, I'm being uh, serious yeah, yeah sure <laughs> no 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 i well well I'll, I'll tell you this i was before i went to prison i was very much a horrible little anarchist robot and anytime i read a book i was i would be thinking to myself is this something i can use in an argument someday to to, to win and uh that was a, a sort of a, a fault you know that's just deep in my psyche it wasn't until i got to prison and was at first facing the prospect of 20 or 30 years when i was able to sort of let myself go and enjoy things like poetry really yeah no. and, and geometry and, and and you know reading you know just uh picking up knowledge that is not necessarily useful uh that that was something that i, I finally was able to do and that's that's very much enriched my life and and, and one other uh, one other question did your diet change Oh, by necessity. Yeah, uh, yeah. Depending on where you are, yeah. The uh, you know, but I'll, I'll tell you, I, I developed a taste for green green beans and rice because that's what they allow you to have uh, all you want of. They have a little tray there, so in addition to your allotted allotted food, right, uh, you can have all this green beans and rice, and I think it's a great a great dinner by its own. <laughs> so, are you, <laughs> do you? <laughs> oh man, I don't want to make light of this, but is that part of your diet now? Yeah, it is actually. Yeah, it's one of one of the things I picked up. Another one is uh, freeze dried coffee. They've got some very uh, strong, very robust freeze dried coffee that they only sell to prisoners. Uh, you can't get it really out here uh, without going to the distributor. And uh, someone someone sent me uh, like eight or nine bags of that not long ago. So I've uh, still got that in my diet. That is that is very interesting. Uh, let's go back to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? Uh, this is Doug from Lake of the Ozarks. Hey, Doug from Lake of the Ozarks. Say hi to Barrett Brown. Hey, Barrett, how are you? Greetings, greetings. Greetings, yeah. I, uh, man, I got so many questions, but uh, I guess I'll ask probably the one that's I consider to be the most important. And let's say uh, someone is uh, maybe setting on some information or they know some things or whatnot. What, what kind of advice or recommendations would you give to someone who's maybe wanting to expose something or... There, there are organizations, uh, one of which is the Freedom of the Press Foundation, that uh, is, right. is staffed and overseen by some very high caliber people who have, uh, they yeah. oversee, I believe it's in the oversee, this uh, secure drop in the Dropbox. It was something that uh, I believe Aaron Schwartz was involved in creating. Yeah. Aaron Schwartz, of course, was one of the one of the really visionaries of the Internet, uh, and he ultimately uh, committed suicide uh, facing 20 years in prison by the DOJ for right. having made available uh, uh, documents uh, from MIT. It was it's another thing we it would, it would take too long to really go into this, but uh, there there are organizations like the Freedom of the Press Foundation that you can find online, and uh, and and uh, outlets of that nature uh, that that have experience in whistleblowing. And you should read their guides on there before you do anything, before you send a single email, before you log on to a news site uh, that you might plan on leaking to. Uh, we we have some examples of of what not to do uh, in some of these cases. I don't want to go in specifics here, but you you can you can find those. Uh, you will never regret being very cautious, and you will never regret reading a great deal of material out there, weighing it, and uh, looking into the people writing it. The Freedom of the Press Foundation uh, is probably the best place to start. Yeah, all right, cool. A anything Man, else, I didn't Dave? have to uh, escape to Russia or anything like that. So. <laughs> yeah. No, not yet. Um, I heard a thing. <laughs> I heard a thing about you know Snowden had his deal in here a while back, and he had some advice, I guess you know for people and and uh and he got you know and but unfortunately the advice was get out of the country you know and uh, well it's, it's good advice I don't know. <laughs> it is good yeah, advice. So. yeah all right man well i appreciate the question i know you got other callers so i'll get off of here and leave you guys alone but i appreciate everything you do jimmy and the youtube mr barrett Th thank, thank you. you very much thank you thank you dave um what uh staying on dave's uh thought process there if you, because I get it every day, as you can imagine, Barrett, I get stuff coming in my email, some stuff I'm afraid to even click on. I don't want to see it with my eyeballs. I don't want to uh, have to face anything later. I'm very cautious about it. What would you do today if something was uh, given to you that, you know, puts you maybe not only in jeopardy, but uh, what, what would you do with that today? 
uh, very similar to the advice I, I would give him or any any other anyone uh, sort of outside of the realm of media, just the the, uh, the person out there who who might come across something. Uh, I would first, you know, set aside what I think I know about security and immediately uh, read some of these guides that have been written by groups like like the Freedom of the Press Foundation before I made a single move, before I made a phone call, even on you know wire or signal or one of these end to end encrypted deals. I would first make sure that I. Uh, have the best chance of having thought about all of those things that the FBI and NSA have had decades to think about in terms of how to catch whistleblowers. There is software. Uh, one of the things that we came across, one, one, of the, one of the times when I did have an informant uh, that worked out real well, uh, when I was provided information about Raytheon, there was a project they were working on, and, and they're not alone in this, uh, software by which to detect whistleblowers by looking at their online habits, uh, that sort of thing. That kind of thing is... As with so much else, there is uh, software and technology and methodology that is kind of hard to uh, hard for a skeptical person to believe in at first. Uh, but that's usually because uh, if you're not a specialist in psychology or, or in uh, forensics or in the intelligence community, there's a great deal that's just not going to be obvious to you. And so, uh, you know, I'll always be aware of, you know, that we came across some very extraordinary and disturbing programs uh, during our investigations, like persona management, which, puts, which creates fake online people uh, and uses them for propaganda and to manufacture events. Uh, there's a lot of things that, you know, objectively, you know, neutrally impressed us with how powerful and dangerous they were. And uh, even putting them out, even putting that stuff out, uh, didn't necessarily get everyone's attention. And so there are a lot of journalists themselves who don't necessarily know what to do if they get very sensitive information. The the community, the, the hacker community, uh, when I went to the HOPE conference uh, in New York, now bear in mind, uh, I went out there to, uh, I was filming my TV show, right? And I went out there to not only attend the hacker conference, which we had all of the uh, 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 the paperwork and everything to film in New York and, and clearance through, uh, hope itself and, and that, uh, those credentials, but I was there for Greg Hausch and, uh, uh, Gabriella Coleman, uh, amongst others. But what I didn't, I thought that the community would take a look at me and go, okay, cool. He's here to, uh, tell our story. It was the exact opposite. I, I, there was a moment there, as you can imagine, Barrett, where I brought up your name a couple of times uh, to get people's opinion, uh, and and was poking, and I felt like I was lucky to be alive. They protect themselves. They protect their own, and I was there to tell the story. They wanted nothing to do with me. Some of these people, uh, especially the ones that we've had to rely on here and there, uh, who are who are hackers, uh, are not fun to work with, and have you know sometimes uh, believe that their knowledge of networks translates into other things that it just doesn't, and so there is uh, over over cautiousness in some respects and under cautiousness in others. There's also a lot of play acting. It's very common uh, among activism. People like to think that they're under more uh, scrutiny for the things they're doing than, than they are. And of course, uh, we know they're under a lot. Everyone potentially is to the extent they do anything. But uh, there's also a lot of what we might call the, the activist version of security theater. And that's, and that's one that makes it, makes, it makes it harder to do the things they're trying to do because they don't really address that and think, think those things through. I'm not surprised that you had a bad experience trying to uh, get the, some of these people to tell useful information to others. Not, not all of them are, are in favor of that. Not all of them are uh, transparency types. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them are just sort of another, it's another elite uh, cadre of, of people who are just there to be elite. Well, and, and eventually I, it took me a couple of days. I broke down uh, some of those barriers and I've, I got some of them to open up, but I'll tell you, I, I, I got on one of the elevators and I've got, you know, my producers with me and, and a director and a sound guy and, couple of cam, you know, I had like 12 people, you know, that were part of my production team. So it, it's big and it's obvious, as you can imagine, right? We stand out like a sore thumb. We get on one of the elevators. We're going up to uh, you know, uh, the top floor there. 
And one of the guys on the elevator, an attendee, says to me, uh, so who are you? And I tell him, I said, I'm here, I, I, I do this, this, and this, and, and I'm here with uh, the History Channel, a and uh, And he looked at me and said, you are out of your mind. Do not talk to me. Don't talk to me. Don't. And I said, but, but, and he, he literally said, do not talk to me. And the elevator doors open and he took off. It was, and I thought, okay, here we go. This is actually what this is going to be like. And it was, it was a rough road, man. We were, um, we were alienated. I mean, we were forced off into a corner and were, uh, um, what's the word shunned, you know, it well, was, yeah. And I, and I should, I should, I should, rem- I should note that, you know, my assessment I gave you minutes earlier in some cases, like with documentary film crews, that, that is a tactic that the FBI has used. Uh, they used it, for instance, I think in, in the Bundy affair, uh, you know, faking a documentary production. So it's possible that someone said, "Oh, this must be another FBI thing." It's possible they're just they're just nuts and rude. That's also very, <laughs> very, very. It's a real possibility we have to explore. But uh, you know, there, there's 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 very good reasons sometimes for them to be cautious, and sometimes there's not so good reasons. Uh, but things like things like Hope, uh, things like DefCon, uh, even the ones who there aren't there uh, as intelligence agents there to recruit. Uh, there is a great deal of informants in that community, especially, especially hackers. I've seen estimates that I don't think you can really ever come to a really useful estimate, but I've seen estimates that strike me as as true based on my experience that, you know, some quarter of the people you might term hackers, criminal hackers, uh, are associated with the government in some secret capacity. Now, that's it's a, it's a matters with the, the definition itself, obviously, is a big factor there. But the bottom line is that this is a community that's fraught through with paranoia. And that obviously hasn't gotten better in the past five or six years. Yeah. You know, the, the famous game, right? Spot the Fed, you know, and, yeah. and, and getting that T-shirt is a badge of honor. We'll talk about that in, in just a bit. Let's go back to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Say hi to Bear Brown. Who's calling? Uh, Bear, this is Casper Parks. Uh, first, th- thank you for everything you've done. Um, I recall back in, in the day when, um, you know, the hack Stratford and trap wire popped up which was a mass surveillance with cameras. And we look now at what's going on in China with that and with uh, what Amazon, with software and law enforcement is doing in Florida. So we're seeing that come to uh, Patrician, you know, it's come, coming out to be. Um, and I was seeing if you had any, any, if you think that's going to get a lot worse now as, as we go forward. Certainly, in large like part because wire, with, that, with that trap wire situation in particular, uh, the press was mm-hmm. not able to assess that in a reasonable way, as in that came out of the Stratford emails at some point. There was a couple of articles. Uh, one of the articles that was in The New York Times, and they quoted two people. One was a unnamed uh, Homeland Security uh, staffer who said, oh, it's not a big deal. I mean, basically said that. And the other one was a guy with the ACLU who I don't think really understood what uh, was being asked of him. And, and so that tone was set early on and you had people like Adrian Chin at Gawker back then, mm-hmm. who, who's always been kind of a goofy uh, fellow, uh, you know, just saying, Oh, this is boring. This is nothing, which he says about everything. Uh, obviously now we know, and that, that was my big problem back then with that particular issue. This is right before I went to prison. I was talking a lot about how, how badly that had been botched because obviously facial recognition, it's not something really exotic. It's something we've thought about and envisioned for years and years. Uh, yeah, and it wasn't something that interested me in particular compared to some of these other things involving propaganda and disinformation that I'm much more interested in. But it was definitely uh, it was definitely something to look into. And obviously, the, the, you go back and look at articles back then, uh, sort of mocking those who, who are worried about it. Well, that's just one more thing in which I think the, uh, the we were right, that that's something that was going to come into play very soon. It's already uh, being used in a number of places. I mean, the, the, tra- the trap wire thing itself was being used in the U.S., uh, the company that that essentially oversees that uh, is Cubic, which is a huge firm that even a lot of security people haven't heard of, a lot of security journalists, uh, which also oversaw like uh, all these subsidiary companies that they hide their relationship to, oftentimes successfully, uh, except when we, when we find the tax filings that uh, prove they own them. Uh, they were the ones that won the CENTCOM contract for persona management, which is something I alluded to earlier. It's the online uh, fake people you can read about. Uh, out there, there are. That's the other big issue here, and that's why even when you find these secrets, even when you are already a journalist, 
and, and are known for investigating these issues and have been successful in them, it's still hard to get editors and producers who don't really care or don't understand it uh, to see the big picture. And so getting, getting that information is half the battle. The other half is, is getting the press to do its job. Uh, I, I want to jump in. Casper is still on the line, and yeah, I have uh, another question, but yeah. okay. Well, uh, Casper, I wanted to, to let Barrett know that Casper is an author and a great author, by the way, and you should check out some of his stuff. I'll send you his books, uh, Barrett. But uh, what I wanted, I wanted to ask a question and have Casper hear the answer. Uh, Barrett, your your writing style is something that is, for me, very fluid. And is it something that, is it your brain directly connected to your fingertips? Is it very, is it fluid? I mean, does it just flow out of you or do you have to work at it? Well, I started writing, uh, I had some internships at newspapers when I was 15 and 16 in Mexico and Dallas, and then got some freelance gigs by the time that I uh, got to University of Texas. And I quickly, uh, I quit because I got a running job for AOL, and so for them back in this back in the two, back in two thousand when there was all this money to be thrown around for online content, and then that dried up for a while. Uh, I was writing about women's shoe stores. I was writing about thirty different Tex-Mex restaurants in Austin and having to differentiate each one. Right. Uh, I was writing forty thousand words on the bands at South by Southwest, and I had no idea uh, what they sounded like. And so uh, that was that was worse than prison, uh, <laughs> you know. And, and so you, so it's something you it's something that you develop. Uh, you know, just like with riding a bicycle or becoming a ninja or anything or anything else. Uh, it's just something that is now ingrained into my neurons, I suppose. Yeah, it, because it, it sounds exactly like you speak or it, 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 no, it reads like you speak. That's the wrong way to put it. Casper, you had one more question. Right. Um, I, I know that um, you know, Harmon had, a, I think it was a twin brother was in a rock band. Uh, I'm just curious how the band was doing, if you knew anything about that. And when Harmon had his, or had, had this trial, there was a question about the judge's spouse has some kind of financial tying to Stratford. And I don't oh, know yes. if they ended up yes. getting a new judge in that or not. I'm not familiar with, with the twin brother thing. Uh, there, it was pointed out, in fact, Kevin Gallagher, who runs, who, who just from scratch built this whole Free Barrett Brown apparatus right after I was arrested and, and managed to raise all this money for my legal defense and managed to uh, sort of lobby the press and get them to pay attention. Uh, he he or someone else noted and publicized the fact that, that Judge Sam Lindsay's uh, wife was on the board of directors of one of these firms. I can't remember which one, but there was an arguable conflict of interest that even, I would say, you know, even if that is illicit, if that is something that rises to the level of he should have recused himself, which I don't really have a strong opinion on, it, it paled in comparison to other things that happened during that case. I mean, the Declaration of Independence was seized from my apartment. Uh, as evidence of a crime. I made sure to note that in my sentencing hearing, uh, you know, so he eventually ordered the FBI to give it back. I mean, the, the whole thing was just so vastly problematic that I really haven't even thought that much about that conflict of interest. His, his big problem was that he believes FBI agents when they go on the stand and no one else does. So Casper, thank you so uh, okay. much, man. When's the, uh, when's your next book coming out? Oh God, I'm hoping sometime after the first of the year. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, uh, you, I'm, shoot, I'm shooting for it. That's uh, you and Barrett together. There you go. All right. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> thank thank you. you for answering my questions. Goodbye. No problem. Thank you, Casper. Thank you. Thank you, Casper. Have a great night. And uh, I wanted to go back. I've got like two minutes, but you brought up uh, Aaron Schwartz. And uh, again, just, just a, a tragic story uh, beyond words. But most people today because of the timing of of everything and how it went down they don't know the aaron schwartz story or his impact on the internet and his talent his talent was beyond measure and when you think about rss and the other things that he was not only fundamental in but they they killed him you know, and they literally ruined uh, a 26-year-old young man that was one of the most talented, period, and responsible for what we are doing today on the Internet. Aaron Schwartz's vision uh, you know, was expansive. And, uh, you know, I spoke at Aaron Schwartz Day uh, last year. That's actually where we unveiled part of the Pursuance Project. Uh, and we'll be speaking again next year. And they've actually been very heavily involved in this Kickstarter we have going on uh, that ends in three days, by the way. Uh 
we're, we're trying to finish uh, something that should have happened already by building this network. Uh, he, he had he had very you know he was a specialist. He was a technology specialist, and so some of his stuff is beyond my purview. But in the broad, in the main, and I, I met him a couple times online when he was going to do some uh, FOIA requests on, on that persona management apparatus we were looking into. And you know, just didn't really know much about him back then. It wasn't until he killed himself and I was already in prison uh, that I learned who it, who it was I've been talking to and, and what this guy was capable of and what we kind of lost uh, thanks to the DOJ. It's an unbelievable story. And, uh, uh, okay, we're going to take a break right here. I mean, I uh, when it comes it, – this is the th- this is what really disturbs me, uh, Barrett – um, when you look at uh, all of these individuals, you being one, of, of course, but how these lives were uh, were affected, uh, and, and in some cases, tragically, like Aaron, who ended up committing suicide because of these threats of, you know, a million years in, in jail and millions of dollars in fines and your parents and your reputation and your family um, all over uh, the Internet, and, and about the Internet and about decentralization and about being an activist. And that, I think, is is one of the most saddest parts about all of, all of this for me personally. It's important to us that a portion of his vision uh, be realized in this project. And that's why, you know, a lot of his associates uh, are involved here. Uh it's important to a lot of people, obviously. The more when you there's some documentaries now about him, so he so hopefully he's gotten some wider recognition, not just for having been someone who was unfairly targeted, but for someone who, in being unfairly targeted, uh, the the world lost out uh, by that, uh, and that's something that I I think uh, over time uh, he's going to be remembered uh, as a very prescient fellow who uh, you know had great potential that the state. As it, as it has throughout history, uh, crushed. Yeah, and every time you see RSS feed, click here, that's Aaron Schwartz. You know, and he, he was a kid when he wrote that and had that vision. A kid, a kid, a teenager. Absolutely incredible. Let's take a break right here. Our guest tonight, Barrett Brown. He's here helping me take phone calls on this very special Fader Night. And we'll continue with your phone calls right after this short break. 323 323- Eight two five five zero four five. I'm yours to be church. More with Barrett and your calls next. Stay with me. Hi everybody, this is Rob Halford, the Metal God, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Okay, nurse, let's get this man to the ER, stat. Right away, doctor. We see this every day. Heart attack or angina pain due to blocked and clogged arteries. Chelation can remove obstructions or blockages from arteries and help avoid painful and expensive surgery. Now there's Angioprim. It's a liquid oral chelation product that you take with juice. You start to feel the results fast. Angioprim increases blood flow all over the body, and that means more energy and strength to take on the day with less aches and pains. 60 years of research has gone into chelation, and angioprim is the result. A safe and easy way to unblock your veins and arteries from buildup that slow circulation. Paging Dr. Jones, please report to the emergency room right away. Log on now for a special radio offer from angioprim. That's angioprim.com slash radio. A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M. Angioprim.com slash radio or call 877-882-7221. That's 877-882-7221. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7 with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online or on the smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Your contact for current news and trending topics, KGRARadio.com. What can I say about the most popular tea on the Internet? And what do customers say about Life Change Tea at GetTheTea.com? A lot. But by federal law, we at GetTheTea.com cannot make claims to how this product can enhance your health. 
We cannot even post our testimonies without being in compliance. So how do we get past the hump? Try our products at GetTheTea.com and see for yourself. You can send us a testimony, but we just can't post it. Bummer. Our products are GMO-free and organic. We pride ourselves in being the best we can be, and we urge you to take charge of your health. We're 11 years strong, and many of our customers have shared their successes with friends and family. Protect your colon. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. 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 Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony, damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black, Fader Nights. Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, at J Church Radio. Simple. And you can also follow Barrett Brown, our guest, at Barrett Brown underscore. And we're taking calls. Uh, the lines are open, 323-825-5045. Now, Barrett, before I get back to the phones, um, I am going to, after the, this next couple of phone calls, before we get to the end, um, I'm going to ask you uh, a couple of UFO questions, and it's it's about the current state of the mass media. It's not going to be what you expect, but don't let me forget to get this in. Okay, I don't want I don't want it to get away from me. Let's go back to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Block. Who's calling? Uh, yes, uh, good evening, Jimmy. This is Phil Christopher's in the Pacific Northwest. Hi, Phil. And uh, good evening, Barrett. Uh, so, Mr. Brown, my question for you is, do you feel that there is actually still a fourth estate that's actually functioning uh, in this admittedly dysfunctional government? Uh, I guess it would well, be a it, phrase, question. A- absolutely, to some extent. I mean, there's still things being properly done here and there. Uh, there are good journalists who know what they're doing. Some of them are, are younger. Some of them have, are sort of old school, you know. Uh, people who've been around a while and have kind of developed talents for investigative journalism. I've seen it happen. I've worked with many of them. Uh, but on the whole, uh, it is not up to the task of serving as our central nervous system for a complex 21st century imperial republic. It's just not. Uh, and that should be of concern to anyone, whether or not you support the imperial republic, whether, you know, regardless of how you think about the U.S., uh, it is not a good thing to have uh, a media infrastructure that still thinks pretty highly of itself, uh, despite all things, uh, because to the extent that they are worthwhile and they are to some extent, uh, when they get things wrong and don't, and don't deal with those things. And that, this is one of my, my main focuses uh, before I got involved with anonymous was media, media criticism. That was my profession essentially. Uh, and it still kind of is, uh, there is, there is no negative feedback for the most part in the system. As in, you can be a columnist like Thomas Friedman or Charles Crothheimer. And you can, if you if you go back and read their output from the last fifteen years, uh, twenty years even, you'll notice that they tend to get their predictions absolutely wrong, and they get away with it because for first for one thing, people rarely go back and read old columns uh, by these Pulitzer Prize winners, and second of all, the, the people at the Washington Post and New York Times don't necessarily care. These are celebrity columnists; they have a name. Uh, their output, the actual whether or not it affects us for better or good, 
uh, is a side, the side the point uh, to them. And most of them don't have any idea. They don't they don't know one way or the other if these are valuable col- columnists. If they were wrong about every single war in the past 20 years, uh, even down to the specifics in some cases, uh, and are still considered uh, by other big mainstream uh, columnists as military experts, for instance. So any other industry that works like that uh, would fail. The media is able to kind of fail without it being as clear uh, of the extent uh, uh, as it would be if it was a mechanic fixing your car. That, that's the very much the nature of politics and sociology in general is that, is that those are the places you can be utterly wrong, utterly unreasonable and still be successful. And so that's a problem. And it's one of the things that we're trying to fix the pursuance by kind of uh, providing this apparatus for crowdsourced research, among other things, and trying to get more journalists to use this and tell them and show them, look, this works. Having crowdsourcing works under certain conditions. And we know a little bit about it. You can find out more experimenting with it. Uh, it'll make your job easier. So that's that's a solution I've been looking at for 10 years. And that's, that's what Pursuance originally grew out of. Uh, and it's something that we can build upon. And meanwhile, we can build up uh, independent press outlets, as has been done successfully in some cases, and expand their reach. And that's that's happened, too. So that's why I would say it's not entirely uh, it's not entirely uh, broken. And it, excuse me. It, it seems to uh, you didn't say it. I will. So I'll I'll state it. It's come down to not about being right or wrong, but it's about clicks. Yes, that's that's a huge part of that's what the people want now for the most part. You know, that's that's a, a, a cardinal sin of humanity that a great deal of the American public has fallen into uh, of tribalism, uh, caring less about principles and more about, you know, some alleged long term goal that you that you feel requires, you know, uh, hypocrisy, you know, obscurantism. Uh, the whole you know, Europe was run uh, on obscurantism for a long time. We call it the Dark Ages. And, you know, it's it's it is not a it, it's the trend that most frightens me uh, that there, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong that we can fix. Uh, but when the media uh, has has severe systematic deficits that uh, are not going to be addressed from the inside and when the public itself, uh, for the most part, even if there are things I agree with them about, uh, you know, the, it, it's it's frightening the extent of it. Let's go to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? Say hi to Barrett Brown. Barrett, hi, how are you? This Fantastic. is Isaac from Anaheim. Excellent call. Um, you make so many good points. Let me tell you, I am very involved in Hollywood. Okay, I can't tell you what I do. But ever since the, the day that Trump was elected, I was on a set somewhere. And, I mean, these people... We're not acting rationally. These people were crying. They were like, like babies having tantrums. These people in Hollywood have been in control for so long with their mind control, MK Ultra, CIA, FBI, deep state manipulation that that is really what bothers them right now. And it's going to bother them as long as, you know, Trump is in office right now. These people knew that they've had control of culture. And now they're starting to lose that control because the internet's taking over. I mean, they still have Netflix, which is part of their control paradigm. They still have China owning AMC theaters. They have, they basically, the Zionists mixed with the communists and the Saudi Wahhabis are now the new axis of evil. Oh. And unfortunately, we're aligned with that. That's a pretty interesting take, uh, and thank you for that, Isaac. Uh, do you see? Well, okay. Uh, let, me, let, let me let me say this: uh, Trump had a reality show for seven or eight years, and he had another show. He he, he is uh, someone who associates very closely with the person that this caller, with the people that this caller uh, attributes these characteristics to. So. Uh, I would find it very surprising uh, if it turned out that he's going to do the things that a lot of the people, for instance, who follow QAnon, uh, think he's going to do. Uh, there's nothing in his history that uh, that really indicates that to anyone who's uh, uh, not just looking for for a silver cloud, uh, the silver lining. This this is a, this is a guy with a long documented history that you don't have to depend on any what anyone said about him. You can go and look at his statements. Uh, and I, I think it's kind of unusual. Uh, I think it's strange that he's been attributed this anti-establishment uh, 
I mean, he is anti-establishment in the way that he does. He does has broken down a lot of the frou frou. He's broken down a lot of the the edifice, uh, which is helpful to people like me, obviously, because that edifice was really the only thing that was convincing uh, sort of vague-minded people that this system is is in great shape. Uh, so that's actually good. Uh, again, I, the, the man he himself has made pretty clear uh, his beliefs about individual rights. He's done it over and over again, and I don't see him as the hero who's going to come and restore uh, all of the uh, the the various things that we were supposedly taken from by you know the Hollywood people or whoever. Yeah, and and I understand the call, uh, but there's another thing about this that, uh, first off, I don't do politics on the show. And one of the reasons why I do the conspiracy of politics, that, that's an easy road to go down. But the reason why I don't do politics, and especially more and more today, is that it absolutely divides and causes anger. I have an audience that is uh very diverse and i want them to stay together and and as soon as today it just doesn't matter the media has chosen the lines in the sand and they enjoy the divide and conquer rule that is that is uh so prevalent and that it, it, it disturbs me so when we talk about trump we could say the same thing about uh, a democrat d- democratically elected uh, president, I think those same issues would be there, and it doesn't really matter. So I just, y- y- do you understand my my take on this? No, absolutely, uh, and it's it's a very reasonable approach. Uh, you know, obviously, the the key thing is to assemble coalitions that can do these things that no one, that no reasonable person who appreciates uh, individual rights can disagree on. So uh, we can differ about what the causes are, and we can differ about. You know uh, the particular people involved. I happen not to think, for instance, that it makes a great deal of sense to say that Trump is going to oppose the Zionists, uh, given what he's actually done in Israel. Um, but again, you know, so it's it's just it's one of those things where people sort themselves out into effective groups that can they can decide for themselves what they're willing to uh, agree with, what they're willing to, to agree to disagree on, and to the extent we get that right uh, and, and bring in people who you know who are intellectually honest at the very least. Uh, then we can see these things being addressed in ways that uh, that I think loose, uh, overly broad uh, ideology and overly broad theories about what is doing what uh, doesn't help us do as much. It's not as effective as, as nuanced thinking. Yeah, and and those days uh, those days are gone. In that, uh, if if you are in a conversation, it doesn't even have to be on this show. It could be at a restaurant. And somebody brings up Trump or brings up Hillary, uh, you know, somebody, what? I'm out of here. You know, and suddenly it's all this anger where whatever happened to listening. And the other thing is that it's really a simple point. This country is built on people being different. And that's what made us so cool. That's what made us so great. Everybody was different. And we collectively just came together. And and, and, uh, because of that, it's what made this country's foundation so strong. And now nobody wants to even contemplate the past and what what made this country great to begin with. It's a it's a fascinating thing to see happen and happen so so quickly in this country. Let's go back to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Say hi to Barrett Brown. Hello, Barrett. This is Gabriel. Hey Gabriel. Hello, Hello Gabriel. Colorado. Um I you know, I'm I'm sitting here listening and I'm just kind of like I mean, you know, ultimately like blown away, but at the same time it's like I feel like your side of of the community as far as breaking open the secrecy and making sure people understand what is being hidden is very important. And it's kind of like how I feel from from like my side of the fence as far as ufology and, and UFOs go, because we are, you know, trying to get all these these secrets broken open and and get everybody to 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 see and hear and understand what a lot of us know to be true. And I think that you you kind of bring that that side of the of the you know the hacker quote unquote side of it. It, it kind of. It almost feels like to me like like we're we're going to be an amalgamation 
where it's all going to come together from all, you know, and, and, and other different genres as well, because there's so much hidden from us. And I kind of wonder how you feel about, you know, the kind of UFO phenomenon as it, as it, you know, as respective to, to like just secrecy as far as in general for what the government is hidden and corporations have hidden and all these things that they do. I mean, how, how, how involved do you feel UFOs and, and ultimately extraterrestrials, you know, kind of reflect in that? It's never been at the forefront uh, of my thinking in large part because uh, it's so inaccessible as in it's for one thing, it's not something that I felt uh, as important as that issue would be. Uh, it's of transcendent importance uh, if we're alone in the universe or not. And, and if not, to what extent, uh, you know, it, it's something that is now taken very, very seriously by people who think about the long-term future of humanity. It's something where there's, there is uh, a methodology that's been composed, uh, you know, by militaries and by, uh, you know, social scientists and by, you know, groups like the Brookings Institution, as you probably know. Right. Uh, it's something that's been thought about. And, and because, and, and I also, what, what interests me most about it is uh, I like anything in which there is a fundamental dispute. Uh, I like, I, I like to, to figure out uh, why some people uh, are adverse to certain kinds of theories, why they're just automatically adverse to it, how they came to that position, whether or not it's valid. Now, in the case of, the, of people who, uh, for some reason, are just virulently, virulently, I don't know how to pronounce words, uh, are very much opposed to, uh, you know, the idea of UFOs, uh, I've tend, I've tend to found, find that uh, it seems to just emerge from this, this uh, things they've picked up, sort of vague ideas that it just they associate something with something silly and then they just write it off. And that's that's something that actually applies very much to what I do. Uh, you know, it, it's easier now. It's, it's hard to remember how, how much more difficult it was 2010 to talk about large government apparatuses uh, that can that can put out propaganda uh, in, in very advanced ways. Uh, but luckily, when we started cracking open things like persona management. Uh, and, and now, given that everyone is very worried about bots, which are which are very simple sort of blunt versions of persona management, which mm-hmm. is a very sophisticated way of running these people, uh, you know, we, we're now. I think it's easier to, to not just make the case reasonably, but to make the case in a way people will accept that uh, you are never well served by assuming that you know a great deal about a specialist subject. And so, uh, people who, who do the the actual legwork and the research and all that and have informed opinions uh, across the board. Uh, those are the people I always respect and want to work with, regardless of what uh, those beliefs might be, if they can defend them. Now, I read a book by Jack, Jacques uh, Vallée. Oh, uh, really? Uh, which, yeah, which I, wow. yeah. Again, like I'm, I'm very interested in, uh, you know, what you might call the, the psychology of thought. I mean, <laughs> it's a bad term. The I'm, inter- I'm interested again in, in how people come to the conclusions they do, and I'm also interested in very uh, unusual answers to these questions. And right. so. Uh, not being hugely familiar with the UFO literature, uh, I found it was a very interesting take, you know, that sort of uh, it, it was ultimately a agnostic take. Uh, but it was it had very interesting things to say about the uh, intelligence community and the some of the organizations that back in the 60s and 70s uh, were proliferating, uh, some of which were very bizarre and, and why they might exist. And uh, beyond, you know, so so there's there's plenty there that uh if I had more time, I would explore further. I've just been uh, occupied with, you know, dealing with the government here on Earth. And and I I, t- I totally agree with you because like for me, you know, I'm I'm only 36, and I think but like, when I was younger, like my my dad was involved with underground BBSs and you know uh, just just kind of underground um, computing in the very beginning. I mean, he still writes programs to this day. But my mom at the time worked for the DOD in in finances, and oh. so it was like she was giving, she was coming home and confiding in him these things she was learning because she worked under Dick Cheney, and she was learning all these things and seeing all these these all the things going on that she was just you know you know told to process and and pass forward, whereas my dad who was the logical you know analytical deep thinker was like well. What it, why is it like this? Why are they doing this? How does, how does this work? You know, I mean, all these things are coming together so strangely. So his brain goes on this path where he can't believe what's happening and how it's going this way. 
And my mom, you know, is more of a spiritual kind of, you know, who got me into extraterrestrial and spirituality and kind of digging deeper into what's actually real. And the two, you know, have been like, you know, a racing path for me because at times I'm more interested in in what information is being hidden from us from just, you know, like, like your side of the fence because that that is like... It's like you said, it's it's easier to grasp and easier to hold. And for some of us who are only focused on ufology, like that other side of it is just as important and you have to understand it because it's like Jimmy said, where if those kind of subjects come up and we just storm off because we don't want to hear that there's a deep state, then we're we're totally missing the 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 the, the connections between all these pieces. Because all of them are gonna come together and I feel and I, I, I wonder how you feel about it is do you think all of these pieces, once they come together, are going to break down this quote-unquote wall and allow us to have the freedom that we should have in this country that kind of, you know, started as? Uh, I'll, I I'll, can I'll, I'll, I would actually be surprised if a major revelation regarding UFOs uh, led to a comprehensive, improved, you know, freer, better world. Uh, I can see that the, and I think the Brookings Institution, back when they first started looking at the issue and other, other groups that have had policy on, on UFOs uh, for a long time, I think they, that's their conclusion. And they, it could be wrong. And then, of course, that, that presumably would be the reason for uh, having a UFO policy in the first place is, look, is there this huge thing that's going to happen? Uh, how would that change people? And, uh, you know, no think tank is prescient. Uh, they can make, they can make predictions about the future, about human uh, psychology. Uh, in some cases, they have access to more data than we do, uh, in part because they have, you know, all kinds of bizarre, unethical uh, you know, history of, of the CIA and of the Japanese uh, war criminals that we captured and learned from, and the Nazis as well. They have a larger body of knowledge to decide how people are going to react to different things. We also have, of course, you know, the War of the Worlds uh, incident. Sure. So, so I'm, I'm, I can't say I'm an optimist uh, about it. And again, I'm, I'm, I am agnostic. Uh, on most of the issues. I will tell you that the very fact that there is a UFO policy and the fact that Brookings Institution was writing these documents about these things, uh, that is something that uh, any journalist who just laughs and says, oh, UFOs, uh, is a fool. Uh, that is, is ultimately, is immediately your job to look in, into why that's the case. It doesn't matter if UFOs exist or not. Uh, it is a, a part of the human psychology. And uh, to the extent that's true, it can be leveraged by bad actors. Uh, beyond that, obviously, to the extent that it is true, and, and I agree with Jackie Vallee that there is some phenomenon that may be immaterial, it may not be a physical phenomenon, uh, or it could be some combination of things. But uh, to the extent that that is the case, include, to the extent that obviously there are plenty of scientists who do not oppose the idea uh, of, of you know, either extra dimensional beings or uh, you know, sort of physical, you know, old school aliens of the popular imagination. Um, it, it's 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 a crime against against uh, the human intellect and against our progress forward to to use uh, arguments from absurdity and sort of scoff at things uh, without having fully investigated them. And unfortunately, it's a very widespread crime. If it is true, if it were true that there was, for instance, a secret alien government, we would never know about it because how do you how do you begin the process of getting an editor or producer to listen to that? I can't even get yeah. them, for the most part, to acknowledge things that I've already written about elsewhere because they don't they don't believe them if they haven't seen them picked up by other outlets. Uh, yeah. There's just a lot of there's a lot of heuristics involved. There's a lot of just poor logic involved in the way in which we respond to things, and uh, that's one of those things that that I don't see being fixed anytime soon. Gabriel, thank you for the phone call, my friend. Enjoy the rest thank of your you. weekend. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate you. Yeah, thank you so much. No problem. Great thank phone you. call. Barrett, uh, be, can I get you to hang on for 10 minutes, or do a little overtime? Sure, sure. I, I'm not I'm not finished uh, tonight, but I want to go back and actually finish uh, your thought there, which is this. You said something that I think was critical. If you went to your news director or your editor and said, you know, like, say, for instance, Vanity Fair, right? Huff Post, you might get away with it. But if you, you know, you went to them and said, hey, you know, I got this serious piece here uh, about UFOs and abduction or a sighting that happened. And, and I've got this in the, you know, can I move forward with this? Can I go out and, and start to talk to these, uh, these people and these witnesses? Would you even 
Would you even have that conversation with your editor? I mean, where would that go? I can tell you there are conversations with my editors that I've had and that resulted in me quitting uh, eventually uh, over those kind of things. In one case, you know, I was asking to write about something that I had already written about before. This is Romas Coin, which was this, it was this large apparatus that the U.S. government uh, uh, uses uh, – sort of propaganda and surveillance thing. It's sort of too complex for us to get our head around, but it involves all these aspects that we can't point at, like everything from natural linguistics processing to cell phone games. It was a very strange deal. I wrote about it uh, eventually for The Guardian and put out a piece on our, our website back in the Project PM days. And uh, more recently, uh, uh, Max Blumenthal ha- has referenced uh, that uh, because there was one aspect of it that this, this editor could not get his head around, and that was that Apple and Google had both met with... Uh, Aaron Barr and these these uh, companies, HB Gary, the ones that we investigated originally that were That's involved right. in this team Themis scandal, uh, they had met with them uh, and some larger companies uh, to, to work on this recompete contract for this big apparatus. Now, this is something uh, we know. This the the emails on this came come from the same place. The emails came on all these other things that were that were a big news item for a month after we discovered them. The whole team Themis thing, going after journalists, blah blah blah. Uh, but for and we had the emails. I could point to them. But for some reason, this editor, who, who had been an editor at major publications for quite a while, uh, he just didn't think it would, could be the case. And he, he started lecturing me on how I misunderstood something. And uh, yeah, so I can't even imagine, uh, you know, if a, if a UFO crashed in the backyard of where I'm at right now, uh, I'd probably just, you know, uh, I might take some pictures, but I wouldn't <laughs> send him. I wouldn't send him to. Uh, to any of the publications I write for. Luckily, I'm, I don't have to freelance very much anymore. I've got the book coming out and all that, so I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting out of that whole thing because uh, trying to convince an editor uh, of something he doesn't want to be convinced of, or something that that sort of goes against his idea that the press has things under control. You know, a lot of people don't. The reason they don't believe that uh, JFK could have been assassinated by a conspiracy involving CIA elements is because they they have that much faith in the press that they would have gotten it right. And that's a big part of why it's very difficult to deal with anything that, uh, for some reason, even has the the aura of being a conspiracy theory. The the the, the term conspiracy theory, of course, is, is vastly misused as, as if as if conspiracies were not something or some supernatural thing that we can that we you know don't, can't prove. Uh, the DOJ uh, charges hundreds of people with conspiracies uh, every every month. You know, uh, it. it this opens up other other topics, you know, just about how we think about uh, secret secrecy and how we think about the possibilities uh, inherent to humanity. Uh, but this is this is we're we're a race that, you know, thousands of years ago, uh, throughout much of the world, uh, convinced people to build pyramids in honor of their godhood. There's, uh, you know, that the, there is a great, uh, a vast potential of human experience and of human folly. And we have records of a great deal of it. Some of some very recent, unfortunately. Uh, it would be it would be foolish for anyone to ever really set forth uh, to really hold on to a concrete view of life and of and of reality. Uh, and that's what people have done th- for thousands of years. And you know, we look back at them, and now we see they're wrong. Right. We think they're wrong. That's right. And we don't take this. We don't take the same lesson to heart. So that's you know, that's a huge problem that. that informs lots of other little little problems as well well it's easier to just take the easy road right it, it's, uh, it's yeah, really- yeah as a practical as a practical matter no journalist wants to even if a journalist is convinced that there is something uh that is of importance uh that he can probably prove uh via documents uh he has to ask the question question will anyone pay attention will i even get this past an editor and in the process, will I destroy my ability to uh, do other stories? That's right. And that's 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 absolutely the main thing. Uh, th- there is there is less need than there sh- than we would hope in an ideal world uh, for the kind of censorship apparatus that uh, you know some people think we have. A lot of it is automatic. So a lot of it is sell- is done by the failures of of that that industry. A lot of it is is done person to person. It's the failures that occur when people don't think properly. Let's take a break right here, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna hold you over for about uh, ten more minutes, okay? And I really appreciate this conversation. This is Fade to Black. It's Fader Night. I am your host, Jimmy Church. More of your phone calls are next, but I'm gonna hold Barrett over because I want to ask him about those days of disclosure with the New York Times. I'll be right back. Stay with us. Vivica Fox 
here and you are listening to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires. This year we've experienced more than our fair share. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. And last month I decided to make sure my family does not have to worry about food should we get caught in a real emergency situation. Introducing Numana, a healthy, storable product that tastes so good that you'll want to eat it every day instead of just during those times of duress. All Numana products have a 25-year shelf life, are MSG and GMO-free, no preservatives, and are made in America. With the Numana pack in your home, you'll be able to sleep at night knowing that you've protected your family. Not only have I tasted and tested, I own it. Now you can too. Just click on the Numana banner on JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code Jimmy when you order. In addition to a discount, we'll send you an autographed Fade to Black t-shirt. Seriously. Go back, Lee Tappy. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go back, Lee Teppy. Hey, can we talk about something serious for a minute? Your age. Getting old has its perks. But remember, being a few years younger... You know, your hair was thicker, you didn't have so many wrinkles, that extra weight wasn't haunting you, and you just felt better. Well, we can't turn back the clocks and go back 10 or 15 years, but you can start feeling and looking 10 or 15 years younger with Nature's Youth RSF. It's a doctor-formulated daily supplement that helps your body maintain its peak performance and fight the aging process. Imagine sleeping better, looking better, and feeling better. See how Nature's Youth RSF has helped thousands of people just like you at naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. The holidays are coming. Imagine how it will feel when your family and friends are asking you what you did to look so good. Your secret will be Nature's Youth RSF. It's time to start looking better and feeling better. Learn more and order your Nature's Youth RSF at naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black, very special Fader Night. Bear Brown is here hanging with the phone calls, I might add. And uh, he's doing a little overtime with us. I didn't want to let him go without uh, asking you about this, Barrett, which is, um, and it's interesting how you brought up Jacques Vallée and, and Brookings, and certainly you've got a a, a good fundamental foundation here, and I, I think that's great when we're talking about UFOs. But you're also a journalist, and you monitor what the mass media is doing. Back in uh, December 16th of 2017, uh, the New York Times uh, released this UFO information about the Pentagon having a secret program. Uh, some videos were released. A pilot uh, had come forward and so forth. And that spun out of control. And we had about two or three months, I'm sure you saw all of it, 
of constant media coverage of the UFO subject for the first time ever in the history of of this country. It's never been covered like that before. Uh, two things came out of that. One was the coverage, but the second part was the mass media suddenly, whether it was print, online, or television, was suddenly comfortable with with the subject. What what did you think about that as you saw this front page news of of UFOs for the first time? My experience with both being a subject of the press and being a journalist and a press critic who, who pays special attention to journalism is generally that uh, a lot of the things that go down are very much the complex results of uh, uh, personal ambition, careerism, uh, heuristics, you know, just uh, poor thinking, uh, money, and uh, ideology, but uh, mixed in in all, uh, different amounts uh, that varies from outlet to outlet. There is also, of course, historically a degree of infiltration by intelligence communities uh, uh, of the U.S. press, and that was, I think, at probably at its peak uh, in the later end of the Cold War or the 60s and 70s, when you know you had Reuters, uh, you know, Washington Post, Time Magazine was, you know, voluntarily sort of in the service of the CIA. Henry Luce, you know, was, you know, uh, having said that, right now, uh, so I read that article when it came out, and, and I was obviously interested to see what would come of it from the press, and uh, I didn't. I didn't pay close enough attention to know, to, to see how much coverage there was in the aftermath. I, I did find it uh, very telling and unsurprising that uh, there was a, a mention in that article of this alien alloy that was being held uh, in a building, uh, I guess, in New Mexico. Uh, something that was sort of noted in passing and then right. not really dwelled upon. Right. Um, and so uh, there's a number of frameworks this can fall under. This t- we can explain this as uh, my my framework for this is that for some reason or another, uh, you know, these figures around that project, uh, which is, in my understanding includes some people who are basically private citizens who were always, always interested in UFOlogy and have now been approached and asked to sort of, uh, I guess, oversee this this uh, media initiative. Uh, and beyond that, uh, beyond that, my, my interest has mostly been in how the press takes it. And the press, you know, I, I don't think uh, did a great job of, you know, running with the questions here. Like, what's the deal with that alien alloy? That would have been my first question. Like, right. hey, you just said there's an alien alloy in this building. That's kind of a huge deal, which has been sort of buried the lead. Uh, I don't think the people who wrote that article, I do not think they were uh, working in accordance with some plan. It's possible they were being given information by people who were. Uh, I can say that if someone does an article for the New York Times about something like UFOs, uh, it's something that the editors uh, doesn't necessarily occur, encourage them to do. But uh, it's un, it's unusual, obviously. And I'm not saying anything surprising there, but it's it's. I, I wonder at the dynamics there at the New York Times and how this uh, came about. Uh, beyond that, really, I, I, I'm very much. Uh, I'm not sure if nonplus is correct term. I've never really figured out what nonplus means. I am, I am, uh, I am confused about the situation. And there's, uh, and then there's the other side of the issue, which is, and you brought up uh, the Brookings Institute and the other reports uh, uh, that were done by different agencies leading up to this. That once this was exposed, like the New York Times did it, and then it was, you know, CNN and Fox and BBC and everybody running with the story, that religions didn't collapse, right? Wall right. Street didn't fall. There wasn't pandemonium or anarchy or, or civil unrest. That part, it seemed to just just kind of blow by everybody, and there wasn't this this crazy reaction that others had suggested would happen once it was exposed like it was. Part of that has to do with how bizarre things are already without bringing UFOs into the thing. There's always, there's a blanket of, of, of unusual things going on that, that probably muffled it a little bit. But but un- undoubtedly, that's also because, you know, a, a limited disclosure like that, regardless of, of, the, of the truth behind it, uh, that is something that people can uh, easily accommodate into their worldview. The people who uh, believe that UFOs definitely do not exist and that they're, you know, just or whatever, 
uh, they have no, they'll have no problem with that. They'll say, oh, this is some creative some kooky guys, and just, there's nothing to it. They'll say that. The ones who are very, have, have very uh, fundamentalist relig- religious beliefs uh, around the world uh, will incorporate it very quickly and easily into their worldview, just as the Catholic Church has done for thousands of years when they've needed to. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is that we are, we are, pe- we are these conscious beings that exist in this, in this uh, incom- incomparable situation already. And so really nothing should surprise anyone. But, you know, that there are – there are sort of mental structures in place that, again, that can make some things dangerous. But, the, you know, a lot of the metaphors that they use about, you know, a, a one civilization more advanced encountering another one, and that civilization uh, collapses. You know, that's often true, but it's often not. I mean, the Chinese had no problems, uh, you know, encountering people with, with sometimes more technology than them and incorporating them into their culture. And they've done a great job of that in the last couple hundred years. Uh, and a lot of the examples of, of you know, the Aztecs, and Incas, uh, you know, there are other factors there. It wasn't just they were overwhelmed by, by uh, Cortez and, and, and company. Uh, there were just there were just other other factors in play. So I just uh, I can still see why a high end uh, sort of think tank person uh, around the government intelligence would have been concerned about that possibility uh, back in the fifties, especially uh, what they do do about the sort of Cold War thinking. Um, uh, I guess we know. I guess we now have more knowledge about how the public will react to uh, gradual disclosures of any contact with aliens. We 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 know that now. I guess. Yeah, and the the other, uh, uh, and you're right uh, about one point. And before I even say what that is, I I do want to thank you for coming on tonight. It's been an amazing conversation. I look forward to uh, talking uh, not only in the future, but. You mentioned uh, QAnon. I do want to get into that with you at a later date and some other stuff. But uh, just been a fascinating conversation. And thank you. But you did bring up, uh, I think, a very important point. Some of the stuff that you exposed, uh, not only with uh, uh, some of the surveillance programs and the uh, civilian contractors and corporations and the MIC, the military industrial complex, that are are using against our citizens that that takes away some of the shock of other things that would be exposed later you know and that's i think that's a very good point uh, that you brought up and you you were part of that um now before i say good night uh kickstarter has got three days left uh where can everybody go we do have one of the links up for kickstarter but pursuanceproject.org is the Kickstarter listed there. Absolutely. It's at the very top there. So you, you, can, you can look at the project and you can look at the information on the Kickstarter at that, at that link. So you can get a good overview of what this is and why it's worth your support. Thank you so much, Barrett. Welcome back, man. <laughs> it's good to be back. It's, it's, it's kind of good to be back. It, it, you know what? <laughs> uh, go eat some string beans, man. And <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> and I can't wait to have you back on the show. Uh, I know I'm looking at... Uh, these reactions uh, from everybody tonight inside inside of this community. And it's a large one, and they just really enjoyed the show. Thank you so much. Thank you again for having me. I appreciate it. Barrett Brown, everybody. It's very simple. Go over to jimmychurchradio.com. You can click on the Kickstarter links there, and it's also pursuanceproject.org. Go and check it out. It's an unbelievable project. He's been thinking about this and putting this into place now for almost 10 years, and it's ready to go. So you can go and do your part over at Kickstarter and go and read about all of the details at pursuanceproject.org. So with that, thank you so much, Barrett. Behave and be well. And uh, I need to, as I say goodnight to Barrett, um, I'm going to get back to these phones. I've got so many calls that have been on hold, but Barrett just did... uh, two hours and 15 minutes tonight on fader night and took all of those phone calls so there you go let's uh let's go back to the phones hi you're live on fade to black who's calling deb from sacramento hi deb what'd you think about that conversation i mean i had questions i wanted to ask him i'm bummed that i didn't get to him in time because of all his research and everything but yeah i mean a fascinating person and thank god he's free yep (laughs) finally unbelievable one of the points that he brought up uh i didn't want to uh dwell on the prison experience uh he's he was he was like jimmy i'll talk about all of that 
But I didn't want to revisit those because it's, you know, it's not exactly a fun time. But after he gets out, the second he talked to Vice, they arrested him again. And I was uh, reaching out to Barrett uh, to come on Fade to Black. And, uh, you know, and, and we had, I was pushing, and it, it was about to happen. And then they turn around and arrest him for speaking to Vice, which stopped him from coming on this show. And I just, I, it's like revisiting the nightmare again for him. And they they held him at an undisclosed location, and they wouldn't tell anybody, his family or anything, what was going on. And it was like the nightmare started all over again. It was an unbelievable thing. He has been through a lot. Uh, just talk about. Sounds like it. He takes activists mm-hmm. to a whole nother level, man. He he definitely uh, uh, lives up to everything that he uh, says that uh, he is about. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Hey, can I go down another road here real quick? Sure. Okay. Because I didn't get to talk to Barrick. Since you had Emery on the other night, man, my head was just wrapping around the information that Emery gives us. And one of those things that he dropped was Malaysian Flight 370. Mm-hmm. And when he disclosed what he what he felt what really happened with that. Um, and I, I think the fader nods, the audience is so big, a lot of people tune in. So I hope everyone, and you know, relates to what I'm referring to. So as I thought about that situation, it's like, so when they do something like that, is there thinking, you know, well, we got to snap this whole plane full of people to save this server and save possibly thousands of military or uh, government lives because of the sensitive information on this server. So does the means justify the ends? And the, obviously the answer in their mind was yes. And so that made me think back to a conversation that you had with Tom DeLong. Um, and I think, I don't remember exactly how he put it, but he was talking about how um, the guys that have been, you know, they get to, we all get to go live our lives and they're into the heavy stuff and we have no idea what they're dealing with and they have real hard decisions to make. And it kind of made me go down that road mentally, like, well, what was he referring to? But yet he couldn't talk about it. So does the means in his mind justify the ends also? Because he knows supposedly these inside things that they have to sacrifice one thing to save, you know, who knows, thousands or millions of people kind of just got me to thinking. Well, the, what I found, uh, and I'm in agreement with you uh, in that there's something going on here. And before we go, well, wait a minute, you know, I, I brought up the possibility of, you know, a portal and or U- UFOs. I was thinking something supernatural, paranormal. But there was when when the second plane was shot down, there was this is where I had an issue. So I go back and I looked at Malaysian Airlines. Now, before anybody picks apart what I'm about to say factually, don't worry about doing that. I did go back and look and I think they had at the time something like 12 planes right? 12 or 14 or whatever. And Uh we have to stop and think about the odds of two identical planes for the same airline, right? (laughs) You know, and, and I just thought this is way beyond the odds of the known universe. You know, this is like, uh, somebody hitting the lottery, uh, the 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 mega uh, two weeks in a row. I mean, what are the odds of that, right? And and not only those odds, but the fact that it came from a, such a small pool of airplanes. It's a very very small number, and I thought that there's got to be a way that these two are connected. Could it have been the same plane? Now, when some of the conspiracy guys out there that were looking at, I got tons of email, Deb, showing me uh, the photographs of the plane and and different angles of it and things that said that it was the same plane, that it wasn't a different plane. I realized that, I forget, one of the guys that was presenting this stuff was getting his website hacked. 
and and images were disappearing. I can't remember who it was. It doesn't really matter. She imagined that. I mean, imagine that. Right, right. <laughs> and and so I'm trying to chase down this info, and every time I was getting close to starting to see it, the, these images were disappearing, and and the site was hacked. But I that's when I had to back up and go. Wait a minute here. How gullible is this planet that? they are able to accept that Malaysian Air lost two planes like that nearly back-to-back and that we're just supposed to go, ah, well, you know, stuff happens. You know, I want to use another word there. That, oh, yeah. it just it just, it just <laughs> happens. No, it doesn't, right? But nobody, it seemed like uh, to me when it came to... Uh, not only what happened in the Ukraine, but the original Malaysian uh, plane disappearance, that there were no journalists out there and no organizations that were willing to ask the very simple basic questions, which is how do you lose a plane on radar when we have worldwide GPS these days, that um, Rolls-Royce has all of the real-time telemetry going back to their company for every Rolls-Royce engine that is running on this planet, and they are able to look at the status of any engine, and suddenly when a plane disappears, they don't have that data. You know, and and these are very basic fundamental questions that weren't being asked, and I was very frustrated with that. I I didn't understand why, and I still don't to this day, uh, why somebody doesn't go back and... Uh, investigate the story that everybody was willing to just let it go. Oh, the search ended. Because okay. the press is, you know, the press is the pre- the majority of the mainstream media is paid off and to to suppress these things, and that's why they arrest people like your guest. <laughs> you know, they do not want the truth coming out about this or Vegas or nine eleven or any of it. And the minute that that story came out of Emery's mouth, it suddenly, I mean, number one, I believe anything that he says because I think he's very credible, but um. It just kind of made it made so much sense. It's like, whoa, there we go. Well, yeah. and 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 um, we have everything about three seventy with all of those questions that are there. Okay, there's home there. Mm-hmm. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of unanswered questions there. There's that part. Mm-hmm. But when we go back to the Ukraine, we have the plane, we have the records. And uh, it is in a, a, a civilized part of this world uh, where you had two armies uh, against each other. And so there is there is the weapons on the ground. There's the flight data. There is uh, black boxes. There are uh, radars. We uh, The ability to find out what kind of missile and where and who uh, shot this plane down that all of this investigation and journalism would be easy to do, and none of it was followed through on. None of it. It's a, that is a crazy, crazy situation where, and the world was just willing to just go, oh, well, whatever. It, it was just, you know, it just it was shot down and crashed. You know, it doesn't matter who did it, whatever. Um, and no ability to go to the crash site, if you remember, right? Um, and, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and it seemed to be uh, accepted. And I, I was very frustrated with that. I would, I would have thought that there would have been an army of researchers, investigators, and organizations that would have put up a fight and gone in and, and tried to uh, find out the truth. But it never happened. You know, so why didn't it? Was it because it was the same? Was it MH370? Right. Was it this crazy conspiracy theory that people have been talking about? Well, now, you know what? We'll never know. We never will. Well, uh, let's not forget the CIA is the one that created the term um, conspiracy theory. So they did it for a reason. You know, people who want to seek the truth, there's nothing wrong with that. But we're not allowed to. Well, we will on the Internet. We search and we search. But then, you know, we're, you know, discounted as conspiracy theorists. But credible people like Barrett, they arrest him. And look what they did to Tommy Robinson. So, again, you know, it is it is very frustrating. It, you know what was really cool tonight uh, with Barrett? Now, I had no idea about uh, Barrett's UFO knowledge. Okay? Didn't know. And I've been looking at his life for for 
for a long time and uh, been a big fan of, of not only his work but his fight for for journalism and freedom of speech. Um, but very refreshing to hear his take when he is talking about he didn't mention Project Mockingbird by name, but that's what you know he was suggest. So he is quite familiar with all of these subjects, and he was very comfortable in in going there. I, I was very impressed with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the minute he said he picked up Jacques Vallée's book, I could hear the surprise <laughs> in your voice. Like, oh, whoa, really? I did so, too. Yeah, that was cool. I did. I was like, D- he didn't just say Jacques Vallée, did he? And, he's an open dude, man. He's a researcher. I mean, he said Brookings Institute, I. you know, and you've got to uh mm-hmm. you've got to have a basic little foundation to be able to go into those zones and and talk about it. Uh very very bright guy uh with his feet on mm-hmm. the ground and what what a great show tonight. Not only uh for the Fader Knots but for myself too as well. That was just an amazing conversation. I'm glad he's on our side. <laughs> oh, he is a hundred percent. I can't. And then he said yeah. QAnon. I was like, "Oh, here we go," you know. And I, 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 I just thought we're gonna. I, I wanted to talk to him about QAnon, but he, he is somebody that, as busy as he is uh, with the Pursuance Project and his new book, you know, my glorious defeats, and and everything that he's got going on in his life, uh, to say these things right in a row. He uh, he is well read and he is on top of the on top of the world uh, as far as research yeah, on goes. Top, on top of some of the rhetoric too. And let me just say in closing, because I'm going to let you go, Jim. I'm a big Trump supporter, but I um, completely discredit the whole QAnon phenomenon. I think it's a psyop distraction. Take people off what's really important. Well, so, and I probably I probably just made a lot of enemies, and that's all right. You know, it's freedom of speech. But I do think it's show, a distraction. Deb, that's what this show is all about. Have a great night and enjoy your weekend. Thanks, Jimmy. You too. Take care. Thank Thanks for you. taking my call. And with that, that will wrap this special edition of Fader Night. I do want to thank uh, Barrett Brown for not only coming in and uh, engaging in a very amazing conversation, but manning the phones here. That was just incredible. What a great conversation. Again, pursuanceproject.org. And the Kickstarter links are over at jimmychurchradio.com. And we do have them up right there in Twitter. Oh, man, I want to thank everybody that not only tweeted tonight, but all of the phone calls. What a great conversation. Fade to Black's executive producer is Rita Kamarian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew, the geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. Syndication is KGRA, The Planet. This broadcast is only copyrighted 2018 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. You can follow Barrett at BarrettBrown underscore. Until Monday, everybody be safe. Go Bagley Tappy.